I met a gypsy. All right, we'll get rolling. Tyler Pierce, welcome to Gypsy Tales, my friend. I'm uh, stoked we finally made it happen. This one's been quite a while in the making. I've been bugging you for a long time, dude. I've been sliding into your DMs as much as I can without trying to be a pest about it. Uh, and I, I think I reached out to you sort of like right before you kind of blew up. Uh, you had like a real skate ramp trajectory. Um, I mean, I'm just a fan of all podcasts, but and I'm a huge fan of motos. Uh, I've raced motos since I was like eight. Um, never really got anywhere with it. You know what I mean? But it doesn't matter. Like you ride bikes and you have fun. And so, yeah, uh, yeah. anyways, I've just been a huge fan. And, and so anyways, I was trying to hit you up like, dude, let's do a podcast. And then, then the, the people you had in this chair is just like unbelievable. Uh, and and then to be able to sit these people down and just talk to them in this long form, like that that's the only way to do it, right? Yeah, man. Yeah, pr pretty lucky. And it's funny, like when you guys walked in, you're like, fuck, this is crazy. This is like futuristic. Uh, I think that's been one of like the really fun things as well. Like, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm definitely excited to talk to you about the, like a lot of the YouTube stuff that you're doing and the... the you've got some really cool shit going on and it's just funny like i like pretty much just have a blanket rule like if someone asked me to come on the podcast like i don't want them to come on the podcast and you're like one of the exceptions to this rule so uh, i literally heard, i was uh, listening I've, to a yeah i was listening to a podcast where you were just <laughs> talking about that uh it was with the um the real estate dude you know you were it was a clip where you were saying you turned down yeah. uh and then you'd said i have this oh, rule you yeah. ask to be on the podcast and I'm listening to that and I'm like, as I'm DMing you, I'm like, shit, dude, <laughs> I'm asking him to be on the podcast. <laughs> nah, but sometimes, sometimes it works out. A couple people get through. It's honestly, I don't know what it is. It's a weird thing on my end, but, um, yeah, we're here now and I, I'm stoked. I've been watching when we, you hit me up a while ago and I started watching, uh, some stuff on YouTube and I was definitely, I was like, fuck yeah, like he actually kills it. This is pretty sick. Um, but it's just sometimes these things are super hard to work out. Like even, I think we got Chase Sexton coming on this week. Um, and it's like, that's been in the making for over a year. Like so it's just the time difference, the schedules, the this and the that. So yeah, I hope I didn't come across like a dick that it's taken this long to get no, happening, well, but we're here now. Not, not at pumped. all, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Super stoked. And so uh, when I hit you up, I had, I think I had just done Impossible Route episode one or, or like season one episode one where you know like okay so if you don't know anything about me i'm just a normal guy uh that really loves bikes and i kind i got into youtube um maybe seven or eight years ago and just tried to navigate that space but there's yeah so much noise out there and so like how do you cut through that noise like how do you make something good and so um, and then I didn't have, like my first video was an absolute piece of turd, you know, like it was not good. Yeah. Um, and, and then I just had a day job. And so, you know, I was making websites and in, in that time, like, well, what am I supposed to be doing with my time? Like I, I so I pitch a project, mm -hmm. I do a website and then I have all this downtime. And so then I wanted to like hone a skill. Um, and then I actually was putting a lot of energy into my son. Like he started riding motos at two. We got him a Strider at one and a half. And so then we got him a CRF 50, but his legs weren't long enough. So I cut the seat out, like dipped it and then took the linkage out. So like he was standing and sitting at the same time. And so then he was just riding around and enjoying it. And, and then I kind of started making like videos of him. Uh, and then I kind of just found this like passion to like create content. Uh, it, very similar to you. Like I was just making these kind of moto edits for my son. And then I, we got him a Cobra 50 when he was four, which d d those things are rocket ships, dude. That's I, a lot. I was like, a hundred, yeah, that's well, a so, lot. Dude, I'm 160 pounds and I got on that thing and I'm just like 40 miles an hour instantly. Right. And so I, it, for him, it was too much and he was kind of afraid. And so then we'd actually gone out to uh, this moto track and it's like, dude, at the time, buying him a new moto was a lot for me. Like, that's a lot of money. Like, I don't have money. Like, th this is this is difficult. I don't have any motos. Like, I used to race street bikes and I used to have a motorcycle shop and I, I was really in the industry and then I sold everything because I, I had a shop, a motorcycle shop from 2004 to 2008. Um, the yep. heyday of, of the moto industry, right? Like, just money galore. 
but I went out of business when everyone, the economy crashed, I went out of business. I lost everything. Uh, anyway, so my son, I, I just put all this energy into him and then I became a moto dad and I didn't want to be right. I, 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 when I rode, my grandma was always around with me and she was just the yeah. nicest woman, right? I'm getting last place. I, I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm falling, but I'm the greatest that's ever lived. You know what I mean? Like she was just hyping me to the moon and, and I wanted to be like that to my son. But then I don't know. It was really weird. Like I, I saw myself becoming a moto dad and we were out at the track. He was wanting to play on the playground. And I'm like, dude, we drove two hours. You have a brand new bike. Like it's cost me a ton of money and you're on the playground. Like, bro, we can be on any playground, like get on the track. And then he's like mad and I'm mad. And then we're driving home and it's just this, it's just not good. And I was like, bro, this is not how it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be having fun. And then I told myself, I'm like, I'm not going to ask him to ride. He has to ask me. And then he did it for like four years, <laughs> you know, like he just never asked me to ride. And so by, he was like seven or eight when, uh, he actually started going to school with Ryder Ellis. Um, I don't know if you know anything about the amateurs, but Ryder Ellis is like killing it anyways. So, uh, yeah, then he yeah. saw his buddy Ryder Ellis smashing and then he was like, I want to smash. And so then it was kind of his decision to start riding again versus like my decision to put him into that thing. But while he was just kind of figuring that out, I decided to put some time into to my own brand, got going with YouTube and, and, uh, and yeah, man, then, then in the last like year have really tried to make like films, not just YouTube yeah. where you're, you know, clickbaity and it's just like whatever. And it, you know, you put all this work into an edit for a video and, and then you got to do that again and again and again and again there's like no life again to YouTube again, videos. again yeah and yeah, so I wanted yeah. to make a film where it's like in five years this still holds water someone's gonna watch this in five six yes. years and and be motivated by it and so then that's what we yeah. were able to do myself and Jeremiah Bishop sort of invested in ourselves and we actually climb we were the first two people to climb the gravel side of Mauna Kea in Hawaii um on gravel bikes and like Jeremiah Bishop's a two-time national champion, like legend of the sport. I'm a nobody, right? I just, I can make yeah. an edit, but that's it. Like I can edit videos. Like, so other than that, like I don't have any uh, uh, pedigree to be here. And so then what was so funny about this very first episode where we had no sponsorship, like this was just what I wanted to do. I wanted to do something. So like, I'm not going to wait for someone to give me money. I'm not going to wait to have someone say yes. Like, let's just do what I want to do. And so then we got out there and I'm so nervous because I'm with this national champion, like all this like hype around it. And we started in the ocean in Waiapia Valley. We dipped our wheels in the water and then we go to start riding. And all I'm thinking is like, bro, don't be an idiot. Like, don't be that guy that everyone's waiting for. I get two pedal strokes into the sand and I can't unclip and I fall over. <laughs> like just like the slowest crash, <laughs> dude, two pedal strokes into this ride. And then, so then Jeremiah is like, why did I bring a squid with me? You know what I mean? Like, like if you had got a buddy to come with you to go ride motos and then he just whiskey throttles it instantly and loops out the bike and breaks the rear fender. Uh, yeah. You're like, bro, like probably shouldn't be out here, you know? <laughs> like, but yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I pushed through it um, and and it was it was something that changed my life because to that point, I was just an, an average person doing average things. Always looking to the horizon though, man, I'd love to be that guy who's doing above average things. Yeah. But as an average person, yeah. you don't think you can. And so then mm. during this this trip, we're we're going through and you know, we're we're climbing up the volcano the gravel side and it's like windy and it's hard and it's difficult. And I got to the visitor center, which already at that point, you're like nine hours of riding and you've just been climbing nonstop and you're at like 10,000 feet of elevation. And now you have to go another 4,000 feet. Anyways, I laid on the ground and I was so hypoxic and so tired that I had this complete like DMT trip uh, but with no drugs. Right. So what happened was I was so exhausted, um, and that I could see in, in like, a, I was a third person watching two people argue, mm. but 
but this is all in my head. And so I'm having one person go, dude, you got it. Keep going. Like you can make it to the top. And then there was this other guy who's like, no, man, you're going to kill yourself. You're probably going to die. Like you need to give up. But I, I was sitting in a chair watching these two people argue. And it was the most strangest thing to see. Like, why can't you guys team up? You're both me. But why is there three of mm. us? There's an observer, a positive person, and a negative person. And I'm like, dude, if we just teamed up, we could do this. And so then it was a very <laughs> weird situation where I'm just laying on the ground in Hawaii uh, thinking like, and what was crazy is this was February of 2020. So yeah, like seven days later, the world shut down. <laughs> so uh, it yeah. was, you know, I thought, okay, in, in the space of, I'm gonna get super hippie, in the, in the space of cosmic time and space, this opportunity is so rare that I'm in Hawaii, mm. for one, that I have a chance to do something no one's done before, but also just like on, on a cosmic scale, like how often does this exist? that I can breathe oxygen, mm. that I can pedal my bike, that I can be in paradise. You know what I mean? It was like this such, I was tripping balls, dude, at the, at the visitor center in Hawaii. <laughs> and it was like this paradigm shift of like, I, if I can tell my positive side and negative side just to shut up and I, I can just move past that, I can kind of accomplish anything. And then yeah. I, I got up, I started pedaling and I made it to the top and did it change my life. That's so sick, man. Yeah, that's one of the things that I find uh, quite cool about your channel. And, and when I watched the, uh, I haven't watched all of it, but I watched the Impossible Ride link that you sent of you guys riding through Death Death Valley. And I mean, I kind of, I like I resonate with it. And I think it's probably why your channel is so successful and why these films that you're making are doing so great. And it's cool to hear you say that you want to make more films. Um, we're literally just like getting into that now um and it's not something i've spoke about or it's not you know sort of not uh i guess something people would know of yet um but i mean for me yeah like this this podcast was that kind of shift in myself in a way of of yeah i was a pretty just fucking normal dude like i would have a really good work ethic and i really went hard with filming and that whole deal but yeah it was like when i sort of started doing the podcast and I don't know, that little bit of extra like accountability, the fact that it was like my name and my face out there and it was really all come back on me. Like it sort of made me find another gear and it kind of sounds like you had, you know, that similar experience. And now, you know, we've done like our Manji trip and we've been going and doing these races and we've got crazy shit planned for, for next year. And it, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of share that sentiment of just being like a fucking regular dude that just... I really, really want to have a crack. And I'm not, uh, yeah, I'm really not sure when exactly like there was that big shift. Maybe it was a little bit more gradual than, than the experience that, that you had. But um, yeah, I've kind of, I don't know where it comes from, but I got that same feeling of just like, fuck, I just need to send it. Like I'm going to be dead really soon. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, for sure. And that's like the idea is like, I think a lot of people think, I can't do this or there's like gatekeepers, you know, you, yeah, I, I think a, there were, there was a time where, uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago to make a good amount of money doing something you enjoyed was so rare, right? Like making good money was a doctor or a lawyer, you know what I mean? Yeah, or an actor. Yeah. Okay. But all of those things yeah. took so much luck and, and like, you know, uh, like privilege and just all this stuff where you have to, th that almost had to be gifted to you in a way, or you just had to be ultra. Yeah. They were gatekeepers. That's the right way to say it. Right. And now there's not with YouTube, you know, like you can put up a shitty video or you can put up a good video, but it's up to you. You can put it out there. And if you just want to yeah. keep grinding and that's the thing about, you know, uh, I kind of like that, that, that term of, you know, you hold like five pounds in your hand and you hold your hand straight out. And that's not hard until 20 seconds go by, till a minute goes by, till, yeah. and then if you just keep going on the time, like hold that weight out for 24 hours, it's not gonna, it's not possible, right? So just the time of just grinding is gonna mm. give you, like that's, that's your superpower. 
right? Travis Estrana mm -hmm. is another human, right? Like he doesn't, I don't understand how he exists. He's an alien. Uh, the things he can do is unbelievable. I don't have that. But what I, what I can do, what I can control is just the amount of work I put into just something. Just over time, yeah. Right, the consistency. You just keep hammering the nail and and sometimes dude you fail and i've failed so many times um for the first three years of youtube nothing happened right i i made no ad mm. revenue and actually at one point my wife was like hey you're spending a lot of time doing these videos and like you're getting 60 views you know 100 views like and you spend 10 hours on that would video. be like, fucking well, hard bro just do it. that would be and so fucking I, hard i i've not had to go through that thankfully <laughs> Well, I mean, but even no matter what your, the work you put into something, you kind of, and you even had mentioned this, you were saying, uh, you wanted to look at Spotify. You wanted to look at your listens. You wanted to refresh the page, mm -hmm. right? And that, that was going to give you a hit of, of something, right? Like either you're going to be stoked yeah. or you're going to be not stoked. Uh, and it, when you're growing you want that feedback. You want to know that you're you're progressing, but it's so hard because that number is never going to be good enough. And, and when it is good enough, mm. then then you want it to be better. So I remember the first time I got a thousand views, I was ecstatic. I was objectively over the moon. But now, if I got a thousand yeah. views on a video, dude, I would flip my chair You'd over. I'd throw my bummed. computer. Down. Yeah, I'd be so pissed. Yeah. and so it's like weird yeah. how that how that works. But uh, yeah, so the in the first three years I was, I remember I did a video, it got like no views. And I think I even got like a, my first hate comment, you know, someone being like, you should delete your channel. And I was like, Oh no. Uh, and, and then I had this moment where I kind of to myself said, I I'm done. I'm going to quit. Like, this is stupid. Um, and then I don't know what made me make the next video, but it was just one of those things. You just take a step forward. And then you just take another step yep. forward and you take another step forward. And I kind of like in my mind, like this, this, uh, analogy of say you want to try to get to the beach, but you have no idea where you are. So let's just say somewhere in Australia, you just are existing yeah. at this point. If you walk in a direction, you will hit the beach. Yeah. For long enough. Yeah. For, <laughs> yeah. You know, and you might be on the East coast and you started walking West and that's going to be a long ass journey. Yeah. And that shit's going to suck. But if you keep going, you know, you'll hit the beach. Some people, they go in the right direction. You know, some people will sit there and they'll plan it out forever and they never move. But then maybe they have a great route and they're like, dude, I know exactly how to get yeah. to the beach, but they never moved. You know, if you just keep moving, you, you'll get to that, that beach. It may be not the beach you wanted to be at, but make it the beach you wanted to be at when you get there. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, it's cool, man. And th there's definitely something, there's definitely something to the YouTube grind. I was just thinking then I like, I did have the fucking 60 view videos. Like, thankfully, it, it I've, I've fit, for me though, when I really started putting effort into YouTube, like it, it did work well, but there was just like two years where I just didn't know what to do, if that makes sense. But I wasn't really doing it properly. But then I think as soon as I kind of like gave in and like really committed to it and I, I guess I got lucky in the sense that it, it you know, worked um, fairly well, but the product, like the podcast was already doing quite well on other platforms and stuff like that. But man, I just, I respect the fuck out of somebody like you that can come from like literally zero subscribers, zero. And, you know, it's not like you've got these big name people to like draw into your platform like so much of this is just like built on you and like people connecting with you personally um so yeah that that grind and that to do it for three years i mean yeah it was like two years of just not really trying like doing youtube properly and just thinking like this is fucking impossible like i literally looked at it like this will not this will not happen and uh and yeah i mean i think I had the the iTunes stuff doing well. So I like had it doing well somewhere else. So it kind of was like, ah, YouTube doesn't matter to me. You know, like I kind of played like that game. But yeah, the respect for someone like you to just like start on YouTube day one, 
fucking grind and to be you know like you're almost at 200,000 subscribers now and it's just like and every video you do does does well it's like that's that's rare air man like it's really rare um well i mean they, they, that they do they do okay i mean it's not like everyone is absolutely slays you, you don't know what the freaking algorithm is which sometimes so what's interesting is uh i actually uploaded two videos uh basically back to back one which took me 120 hours to edit $35,000 to produce uh the craziest biggest edit I've ever done then I did one with uh Greg Dowsett where it was just a a webcam of me and him racing on a bike for five <laughs> minutes it took no effort whatsoever same views same views and I was yeah. like dude just <laughs> like because he's jacked and so like the YouTube was good it, like the thumbnail was good but it was so funny that I'm like, bro, I spent so much time on this one and I spent no yeah. time on that one. And it, so I don't understand, but, but the thing is like, you want to, you want to feel good about your craft. You know what I mean? And, yeah. uh, I, I want something, I want to put out something where you don't have to know me. You don't have to like me, but whatever that story was that you walk away from going, that was kind of a cool story. You know, and, and, and maybe mm. it changes something in your mind to make you want to go do, maybe you don't ride seven days in Death Valley on a freaking, you know, gravel bike, but maybe you do whatever it is that you thought was po impossible. You know, maybe just riding to the mailbox mm. for some people is impossible. And, and then they get it and they do it and they realize like, oh, I'm actually way more capable of, of cool shit than I thought. And that's where mm. like, I really try to latch on to like, I'm not, I'm not a national champion. Like this stuff is not easy for me. And a lot of people mm. will hide those emotions, right? They'll, they'll, especially in cycling. Cause it's like a real elitist sport. Like you don't want to show your suffer face. You know what I mean? You don't want to say you're hurting. Uh, that's, that shows weakness. I don't care, man. I'll tell you that I'm hurting I, and, and I'll lay on the ground. I'll push my bike. I could whatever i'm gonna finish the thing i'm not gonna not finish but the whole time i'm gonna let you know how difficult this is and so then when people see mm. that they're like okay like I, I can relate to that because i have difficult things in my life but a lot of times with social media you never see that you always just see people mm. you know like you had jet lawrence in here dude he makes shit look so effortless and it's like and then i get Fuck on my yeah. moto <laughs> dude, i get on my moto so uh, the track that we just had, um, Tulare, they had one of the, the uh, Oakland Supercross Futures um, deal. And so they built the Supercross track on, you know what I mean, right there. And, and then uh, I was so excited to go try it. And then you get there and you're like, dude, this is gnarly. Like, I, I, I don't even want to double yeah. any of this, you know? And yeah. then you look at them and you're like, what is happening? And, and. I, I got to do Oakland Supercross Futures in 2020 uh, before they, they shut all that down, which was the most fun I've ever had on a bike to actually be in the stadium with my son riding on the track that basically the pros did all they, they, they cut the finish line lip down just a little bit so that like fifties could roll it. And then they sort of filled in the mm. double to triple. But other than that, it was you know, AJ Catanzaro, you had him on and, and he was there yep. and I was like, Hey dude, you raced this. Tell me what the futures track looks like. And he's like, dude, it's identical. It's the same thing. And so then I'm riding around on this. And so then it gives you this perspective because you watch Tomac do his thing on TV, whatever. Then you go to a, to an event in person. You go, wow, this is kind of crazy. And then you walk the track and you're like, how is anyone even riding this? Then you go to ride it. And, and you're just like, dude, this is, there's no way the TV can capture this. There's no way that a yeah. normal fan can understand that just riding the track takes years of talent. Yeah. The, the thing, uh, the thing, uh, I think I well, like the main message that I try and kind of get out across with all this content, it's probably like a very similar thing to what you're explaining is the fact that. I wasted so much of my life thinking that talent was why Jet Lawrence was good. And, you know, like I went out and I 
fucking had bikes and you know i rode my whole life but i could ride once a week and then i'd go out and that kind of sucked and then i'd spend all week watching exactly what you said like every trans world clip every racer x clip and these guys are just fucking good and it's all you ever saw was guys being good and i just had it in my head oh you're not good and i didn't really realize the the just the legitimate struggle that goes in and just the thousands and thousands of hours and like people say like oh yeah he works hard and you're like yeah but he works hard because he's talented and it's like easy for him to work hard you know like i just had the math so wrong in my head uh and it's actually it's funny like it probably wasn't until i started jujitsu that i started connecting the dots because i was like i'd like i would say i had talent at jujitsu probably the thing of any of the sports that I've done in my life, like that's the thing that I do the best naturally at. But then, so then I did that whole deal. I was like, oh, okay, I'm talented, but now I'm just going to work like fuck. And then I would have people be like, damn dude, like you're so talented at this. And I'm like, no, no, no. I work really hard at it. Like I'm obsessed with this. I've, since I started doing jujitsu, I've watched like 400 hours worth of instructional videos and I've like read books and I've watched thousands of matches it's like and this is all in an eight month period so it's like for the first time in my life I got to actually firsthand experience uh like getting better at something and like by really 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 working at it and then I was just like oh fuck that's what this is that's what it's been all along like you just need to put in an insane amount of work and like everybody's ceiling's different like i'm not i'm not going to be a world jiu-jitsu champion like that's not i'm not that good i'm good for me uh, and you know good in when i say good it's like i'm comparing myself to like me at riding moto or me at playing golf or like i'm good at jiu-jitsu that's just a i guess in a subjective sense but it's like yeah when you really start to i, I think when you have some kind of a success and you probably experienced this in cycling you know like you fucking sucked at the start and then it's like over years of doing it you just you just get good and good in the subjective sense of like where your sort of starting point was and then i think from there you can extrapolate that out into your daily life and i'm like okay well i'll just do that with the podcast and i'll do that with my reading and i'll do that with meditation i'll do that with stretching and then you just start to have like these wins across the board again in subjective terms you know like against your own ceiling and then if you can block out comparing yourself against other people you just kind of get on this fucking treadmill of just like a little bit better a little bit better a little bit better well so jujitsu right so i'm a purple belt under uh Rodrigo, got my blue under hoist i remember you saying that actually yeah so i trained for seven years and so what's to use that analogy the fundamentals in jiu-jitsu are what you learn day one and then you get all complicated and then you're doing the freaking rubber guard and the x guard and the twister and then you get to roll with a black belt and he does you know the most basic the day, day one. one move and you're like wait where's your flying you know triangle dude and he's it's not you know uh he just is perfect posture everything is perfect every move is perfect and so then you can do that with everything in your life like you have fundamentals and if you can make those perfect you don't have to get all crazy with it you don't have to get complicated with it yeah you, you have to you have to develop yeah. a mindset that you apply the same like technique to everything in your life like get the fundamentals and basics down and you'll be a rock star yeah yeah it, it's so it's so true man and i think that that's probably i gravitate towards people that have hobbies that they go hard as fuck at because it's kind of like the same it's all the same thing like i don't care what you do like if you've got something that you really lean into and you really go hard at and i think it's because people have that like it, it is the same recipe you know it's just like get up fucking grind do it whatever it is you do and then repeat and it's like this kind of simple uh, this simple process i guess but it just seems like that it kind of works across the board absolutely and so and so what's crazy is that so you live on the opposite end of the world and give without social media i would never know you existed we would never connect 
uh, and maybe even if you saw my YouTube channel name, you would instantly go, oh, I hate this guy, dude, this guy's so annoying. Uh, but <laughs> when I start <laughs> listening to your podcast and I'm listening to the things you say, like we have so much in common, not to like fanboy out, mm. but like it, it's just, there's so much in common that so many, so many people have so much in common but we always seem to like try to find this one thing where we're like, oh, I can't hang with you or I, I can't relate to you because of this one difference. But, you know, there's so many of these fundamentals that we all share. Mm. And and I think then like bikes kind of bring these people together. And uh, if you've ridden a bike, no matter what level, especially, you know, when you're a kid, dude, you're just having a good time. Like that's one of the first things when you give a kid a bike, all of a sudden the world becomes so much smaller. Like they can go down the street, they can explore, you know, their environment. And then mm. that feeling of freedom is just like unbelievable. Right. And so then, so then, yeah, I mean, being able to hear what you're having to say and being like, oh, like this is crazy. I'm into jujitsu too. And I'm into motos and I'm into filmmaking and you know, uh, I, I've done DMT, like there's just all these things. And it's like, that's crazy. This guy, you know, I want to feel like I'm a unique snowflake that all my decisions and the things mm. I do are super unique that I would never meet another person that likes all these same things. And then you find out there's actually a shit ton of dudes that all like these similar yeah. things, right? It's kind it's crazy. Man, it's, uh, it's funny what you said about the, the whole like freedom thing of giving a kid a black. I, uh, I did a podcast, um, collective experience it was fucking really cool. Uh, but we, we spoke about that. Like what else can you do to a kid at such a young age that gives them that level of freedom of just like putting a fucking motor between their legs, letting them grip onto a set of handlebars and be like, bon voyage <laughs> like off you go and that feeling man like i had no idea until i really started thinking about it through i guess doing this how insane it is of a concept to like give uh, a kid a motorcycle like that and it has infected all of us like all the you know 98 percent of the people that are listening to this podcast they're like handlebar people you know like they spend their life behind bars and it's just like we all got hit with that exact same feeling of freedom and i mean you're watching your son get super into racing i watched the video where he won the race like a couple of weeks ago or whatever and it's like to see that in a kid like that shit just it doesn't leave you eh? it just sticks with you forever and i just don't know what else you could really give a kid that gives them that kind of freedom and that kind of feeling Totally. Well, so what's crazy is that video that I did where he went out and won. I could see the slippery slope of being a moto dad again because I cared nothing about my own success. Uh, I would be willing to give up everything in my life to feel that joy again because it was I, I felt mm. so good watching him win and him smile and and I was as hands off as I could possibly be. He he just isn't really that into com the, the competitive side. Like he'll go out and ride literally from the sun comes up till the sun goes down. Like and he'll he'll come in. I fill up gas. He doesn't even get off his bike. He just is riding nonstop. Mm. But as soon as you have a gate drop, as soon as there's like places, all of a sudden he kind of felt like he, he just noodled around. And I'd be like, that's weird. The difference between how you are when we're just like playing. And then when you are, when you race. Mm. And so I just was trying to be as hands off as I could, you know, no pressure, like just enjoy, do whatever. And, and I don't know, dude, something was totally different in him on that day. And so then seeing him be aggressive, seeing him sort of like move through this threshold of fear without me pushing mm. him, right? Like I, not touching him, he walked through that door. And so then when he's, there's like a clip where after his first moto win, he's I'm like cheering. And then he's just like, you know, blowing his bike up like, yeah, 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 yeah. And like, he's so stoked. And I've never felt and, and I've done some pretty amazing things this year. That feeling was I, I don't know if I have like my mm. own accomplishments just don't even compare to this. And that wasn't even that big of a deal. It was the beginner class at Little Loki on a Friday night, like no big deal. 
You know what I mean? And so I can't even imagine what it would be like to see your kid achieve success on even a bigger scale. But like I said, it's like, okay, I can see the darkness here. I can see like a, like a drug. I, I want that again. And so then you, you go, Hey man, let's go out and ride again. And I think that because I have my own stuff going on, I'm not, and I'm not saying anything bad about moto dads, but you know, if you don't have anything going on and all of your happiness is on them, you know, then that's, that's not a good, that's a bad recipe. So like, you know, Deegan, uh, you know, Brian, he rides too, right? So they go out and they're riding together versus the moto dad who's sitting on the side of the, the, you know, watching and is drinking beer, which is whatever. I'm not talking shit. I'm just saying like when I go out and ride with my son, I'm riding too. So I kind of have to like focus mm. on me and my progression. Uh, and then I'm like, oh, you know, and then we come back. And I'm like, dude, I just tripled that. And he's like, oh, sick. I hit this berm. And it's like, yeah, high five, you know. And then th- that bond is just it's unbelievable. And and he doesn't have that in any other aspect of his life. Like when he rides, mm. he's a totally different human. And then when he's as soon as he's done, then he's like back to being, you know, a little shit 11 year old, like playing Minecraft. I'm like, Dude, you know, we, we, uh, we need to get out ride more, man. It's, uh, it's funny. Like I, I watched that video and, uh, I'm in like a weird spot with like, I would have said that I wanted kids and now I'm like, I don't know if I want kids like, and then seeing the, the video, um, of that, like watching the, vi- guy, the video that you guys made, I was like, fuck pretty gnarly to have a kid and just like if it can bring out like that level of like it's it's just complete selflessness like you said you know that feeling of seeing your son achieve something completely dwarfed any experience that you've ever had and it's a it's a real head fuck man to to think about because yeah like i've literally been thinking lately i'm like do i want kids like i don't know that that's a thing that i want to fucking sign up for (laughs) It's difficult for sure. Um, so I have two kids. I have a four-year-old uh, daughter. Oh, sorry to cut you off. Another point also, I liked uh, that you're very honest about how hard it is to like bond with your kid and to have that relationship because, I mean, it. I think a lot of people, they see their kid as like... So for my, for my experience, like so my dad... And my brother are like super similar. So they always just got on. Like they, I never really even saw them have an argument. Like they were just tight their whole life. And they still are now. Like they're way tighter than what me and my dad are. But in a different way, you know. And, uh, but I was just completely different. And I could just see, and I can still see that my dad really can't relate to me through anything other than, than writing. Um, So yeah, to watch you be so honest and like me and my dad would have we've never had a conversation about that my dad's never been like i just yeah i just don't really fucking get you like your brain works different (laughs) like i don't like the things that you like i don't understand why you you know so it was really really cool to see like that level of honesty like fuck i struggle to bond with this kid you know like except for at the track because that's what me and my dad were like totally Uh, and so that's where but i don't want to push him too much and so it's difficult because it's like I know that we have a really good time together out on the track, but then I don't want him to feel bad if he doesn't want to ride. You know what I mean? And there was there was yeah. like one time where I was so hyped to go ride and then he was kind of like, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not I kind of want to play like me and me and the boys are going to play Call of Duty. Um, he's like, but I'll go if you want me to. And I was like, no, you know, like I don't want I, I don't want it to be like that. Like I need you to want to be there. Um, and we actually went out into Cal city, uh, yeah, t- last year, um, California city has like this badass motocross track that's like fenced off in the middle of the desert. And so then you got to ride track all day. Then, then we just stayed in the van and then we got to ride the desert all day and me and him just like, Hey, there's a mountain over there. Let's go to that. And then we just, you know, mm. take off to this mountain and we get up there and And he told me when we left, because he's so introvert, he's so shy, he's so closed off with his emotions. And so he very rarely says anything. And he said, you know, dad, that was probably one of the best weekends of my life. And I was just like, tears, you just cry. Like, like, fuck yeah, dude. Like, 
dude, this is this is it because it's so difficult to bond with him, which is weird what you just said, because my daughter is exactly like me. And so me and her, mm. I, I can relate to her so easily. And and then I feel a little bad about when my son is watching me have such an easy time with my daughter. Um, mm. And that was actually one of the reasons I didn't want to have a second kid was because I was so worried that what my son was going to think if we had another one and you know what that would mm. what that would do to him. Um, but yeah, I mean, how old are you? 33. Okay. So I had my son, we got pregnant when I was 24 by choice. We wanted to, uh, because at the time I was making unbelievable amounts of money. Uh, and so I've had like a crazy <laughs> career path. And at the time I was doing, you know, so I, I, I owned a motorcycle shop in 2004. I was 18. The housing market was crazy. Uh, I pulled money out of a house. Um, because you could just get a house on stated income. I'm 18 and I'm like, give me money, please. And they're like, okay. Uh, and so then, you know, which is not sustainable at all. But, uh, but so then I take out 50 grand and as an 18 year old, I'm just like, bro, 50 grand buys the world. And instantly mm. I realize how expensive it is. You know, uh, my one of my first purchases for the store was from a friend who had started some whatever clothing company and he had these hats and they were super dumb whatever and I spent $2,500 on these trucker hats I had like thousands <laughs> why did I do that I why did I buy you know what I mean I was just blowing money dude like the floor I had this like custom floor done with like logos like fly racing and fox and you know metal militia and all this stuff dude it cost me like 15 grand but i didn't know what I was doing. And then it was just this 18 year old kid trying to run this motorcycle shop. Uh, but I kind of made it work. And then what was crazy is that my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, we sort of were forced to learn how to uh, be compatible. And so because we mm. had to work all the time and I and, and like I'm super open. So she worked with you. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm super open. I love my wife. Cool. At the time, I wasn't that into her. Uh, she wasn't my type. And I just saw, hey, there's a hot blonde chick who will work for free at my moto shop. And I can go ride motos Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And so, you know, she would work. Uh, but anyways, we, we were at the shop 24-7. I mean, we were open seven days a week. Um, and then so we worked together. We'd come home. And this is, I mean, we've been together for six months, right? Like, Mm. I, she met me right when I was like signing the paperwork for the, the lease. And so then we sort of just like grew together throughout this, this moto shop and we learned so much together, but you know, a lot of relationships you work separately, then you come home and try to bond and that's very difficult. Yeah. But for us, we're 18, we're running a motorcycle shop. We have no idea what we're doing. Um, and so that really connected us on such a deep level where, it, you know, attraction aside, intimacy, intimacy aside, we were compatible because we had to be. And so then, mm. you know, we had this really amazing journey. Um, I spent way too much money. I, I would always have a new set of gear, you know, which is like, dude, I'm the worst customer ever. I'm my own. So we'd get in a new set of gear and I'm just like, well, that's sick and that's sick and that's sick. So then I'm just always having this new stuff and uh, just terrible. You were the fucking, practice. you were the drug dealer that was smoking his own shit. Oh, dude, I, <laughs> I was getting so high on my own supply. And so uh, I had uh, a CR250. I had a CRF450. I had a KX450. I had a Jixer 750. Uh, I had a KLX110. I had a pit, you know, then I had a, a little Honda 50 Dude, just what am I doing? I'm do but at the time I'm doing like 30 grand a month in sales, you know what I mean? And just not understanding anything about credit or debt or how this works. Like parts unlimited, you know, I just had this massive tab with parts unlimited. Uh, anyways, at the time it was good. And so then when in 2008, when everything crashed, um, I lost everything. And what was funny is like, I just signed with uh, WPS uh, mm. and I just stocked a bunch of fly stuff. And then I was going out of business. And so they were like, hey, we're going to send someone to get all that stuff from you. 
And I was like, well, I need money to eat. So then everyone was coming into the shop. I was like, hey, anything that there that it says fly on it, 20 bucks for pants or jersey or what yeah. helmet. Dude, just 20 bucks for anything. And so then there was like a rep for fly, like trying to grab stuff off the walls while people are <laughs> grabbing it from them and trying to buy it. And, you know, it was just like kind of chaotic because, dude, this happened like overnight. Like I was looking to expand the motorcycle shop. And then all of a sudden I had one bad month. I couldn't pay that parts unlimited bill, which then I can't order anything. And so then, you know, someone's like, oh, well, I want this size. And I'm like, well, I can't order it. So then I lose that sale. So it was just like, it snowballed so quick, you know? And then, so I'm trying to get all this cash I can out of the shop. Then the landlord comes and he's like, you know, you owe me all this money. And so this wad of cash I had that I was going to hopefully live off for like, you know, a couple months I had to give to him. And so then I lost everything. Like the repo guy was there. Like I lost my toy hauler and I just went from this, you know, oh, I'm living the American dream. I'm 21. You know, I'm just bawling out to then just, I'm in a house that we can't pay for that's being foreclosed on. Uh, I just pulled the bed out into the living room. I was so depressed. You know, I, I was a moto guy. That's what I was. So I just lost that. Mm. I lost my whole identity. Who am I if I don't ride motos? Who am I if I am not Venom Motorsports? Like, so I pulled the bed out in the living room, dude, and I just, I didn't leave that bed. And I just played like Oblivion, like like Skyrim. Uh, I just played games. And then my wife was like, at the time, she's still my girlfriend, but we were so bonded. And this is what was crazy is everything was falling apart. Everything was going to shit. And I even told her, I was like, hey, you, you know, go back and live with your parents. Like, I got nothing, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I hate life at the moment. And she stuck by me and she actually went and got like a job at color me mine, which is like a pottery type thing. You just like the first job she could get. So she was kind of paying for us. And, you know, I was selling stuff on eBay that we still had from the shop. And it was just like, we were at our lowest of lows. Um, I remember I owed like 700 bucks on my Jixxer 750. Like I only had like two payments left on it. And the repo man's oh, trying to come and no. get it. Yeah, so I, I, I couldn't, I, there's nothing I could do. So I rolled it into the house and I put like blankets up over the walls, dude. Like, cause the repo man's trying to get my shit. And I'm like, dude, you, look, you can take the 450s, you know what I mean? But you can't take my Jixxer 750, dude. Like you're not having it. I, like objectively, I feel okay about that because the bank, you made your money, you're in the green. You know, I paid a ton of interest you know, suck it, dude. Like <laughs> it's a seven, like don't take this bike. And, and, uh, anyways, everything was just getting taken from me left and right. It sucked. And so then I went and I, uh, I got a job being a debt counselor, which was the, the stab to the heart. That was just the worst, man. Like I was the top of the moto industry. I kind of a funny story is I went to San Diego, uh, Supercross, and I was a part of like the no fear, like, booth area and I was hanging out with all these cool guys back when like no fear was popping and then um but I was 19 and so then someone handed me a beer I, I the beer hits my hand and then a cop from behind grabs me and he's like let me see your ID and it was like a and I wouldn't even drink it or anything but he was and I I turn around I'm like no I'm not 21 and he's like you have you have to come with me and I'm like no dude I want to watch James Stewart race you know and like and, and so then I I actually had to I actually had to go to court for like, anyways, it was, but anyway, so whatever, I'm just saying like, I was, I was something in the moto industry or at least in my area and then to have all that taken away. And then I'm a debt counselor, bro. Like I had to put in a suit and go to a shitty ass office. And I was just, but then this, what was crazy is I was talking to America. Everyone was in so much debt and I was talking to these people. They would get lay out their finances. And, and I'm like, okay, well, how much are you spending? And they're like, well, I got two boats. We got jet skis. We got motos, you know, our house payment. And I'm like, okay, so then you make about 12 grand a month. And they're like, no, we do about 1500 a month. And I'm like, well, what are you, what are you doing? And they're like, oh, credit cards. I'm like, shit. And that, so that was crazy, man. And so then I actually kind of learned a lot about finances talking to America during 2008 to like 2010, 12 which was just the craziest time. It was, it was really a valuable experience, actually. Anyways, that company, uh, the pay model for debt settlement got out of control for a minute and you would get paid a percentage of the debt. 
And so then as you closed more debt, you made more money, which I'm an ethical person. You can believe that or you don't have to, it doesn't matter. I wouldn't lie to anyone. I truly wanted to help these people because I was in that situation. Uh, but a lot of people took wild advantage. And f- there was a couple months where I was like making like 10 to 20 grand a month. And I'm like, what the hell is happening? Like I was nothing. I was so poor. I had nothing. And now I'm just cashing checks left and right. And so then I, uh, and you don't uh, have the I was, overheads of a shop. No, nothing. Right. I have, I have, yeah, there's no overhead. There's nothing going on. I'm stacking cash in a safe in my closet because I, I don't trust the banks. Cause after I lost my business, uh, well, I had a buddy. He's yeah. like, Hey, do you want to make some, he's like, Hey, you want to make some money? And I'm like, yeah, cool. And so I went and did construction for three days the hardest work I've ever done in my life. Do we built some building in the middle of nowhere? It was a thousand degrees. You know, uh, I made $600. I put it in the bank and it was gone instantly. Right. Because I like owed the state board. So I, I just gone. I was like, dude, I three days of the hardest work of my life, bro. And it was gone. So then I didn't trust the bank. So I'm just stacking cash in this safe. And so then I go to, uh, you know, my wife and I'm like, Hey, um, let's have a kid. You know, and this is right before 2012. So like a little end of, you know, Mayan calendar type. Of that. We actually had dinner and I was like, hey, like yeah. what if the Mayan calendar thing and, and like the whole world blows up? Like, wouldn't it be cool if we had a kid before that and like had that experience? Because I was so confident that this money was just going to keep rolling in. And so then she takes the pregnancy test. It's positive the next day the government steps in like they should and be like, Hey, you can't make money this way on debt settlement. So then all of a sudden it was like, you made $50 on a, on a debt settlement close. Right. So like now I'm back down to make making $500 a month, you know? And so and I was like, Oh shit, man. Uh, and so, so anyways, this is a long story to wrap around about having kids. But like at the time I made a decision to have a kid based on financial stability and then instantly went into the most unstable financial period of my life. But when you have a kid, it changes what life means and that I don't need a Mm. Ferrari in the driveway or a new motor or whatever. Like once that pregnancy test was positive, all I cared about was that he was healthy. And so then Mm. that kind of changed my whole perspective on what value is like, what, what is, what do you Mm. put value to? Is it monetary things? Is it a nice house? Is it nice stuff? Is it going out to dinner or is it having a healthy child that's happy and bouncing? Mm. And so that, you know, and you're never really ready for that, but it changes when your kid is born. um, When my son was born, my wife, actually, she's like real tiny and like he wouldn't come out. (laughs) So they put this suction cup on his head, dude, and the nurse is just wrenching on him. I'm like, chill. Like, this is a brand new baby. Anyways, rips her in two. She's like bleeding. She has to go into the, like they had to go into surgery and she like almost died giving birth. And so then me and my son are just, I'm just holding him and I don't know what to do. And I'm like, dude, did I just lose my wife? Like what's happening? And, but that like moment of hormones and pheromones and just like this crazy shift I remember when they handed me the baby, I was like, bro, I'm not ready for this. Like, no, 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 you, yeah, you do yeah. something with him. You and look they were like, no, this, bit. yeah, <laughs> yeah, like this is yours. And I was like, ah, I, I don't know what I was expecting, but it wasn't this. And, um, it just changes, man. You're you. And so that's the thing is like, you do things in life that you don't know what to expect. You don't know where they're going to go, but a lot of times they completely change your life. And you just kind of have to roll the dice or like you said in the beginning, like just fucking send it to just, just send it and, and you'll make it work. And I, I, I don't think if you ask any parent, they're not going to say they regret it. Mm. Yeah. 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 No, it's a fuck dude. It's a trip. And like, I got uh, one of my best friends, like we grew up together. Um, he like lived four doors down from me. We're still super tight. And uh, he had a kid the other day and he's the most like, he had like a really hard upbringing, like really, really hard. Pretty much him and his brother kind of like lived with us because it was just fucking chaos. And there was a lot of that shit around us. And, um, and so he's like not an emotional dude, 
not like he's a hard fucking guy and uh he had a little girl a couple weeks ago and he was just like dude he's like my whole life changed like instantly the second that uh that that kid was born and i mean you kind of yeah you you hear that shit from from basically anyone that has a kid but i'm sitting here just feeling like Whew, i don't know man i feel like i'm fucking barely keeping it together as it is <laughs> well for sure and you know kids make it difficult so right now i'm actually this is my third year doing what i would call the train like a pro challenge where i do in the month of december i just throw my life into chaos and i do everything i can to 11. So I make a video a day, which is hard as shit because I'm doing the editing, I'm doing the filming, I gotta make a story that makes any sense. So I make a video a day, I train my ass off, we do 20 plus hours a week with, uh, with structured training, then try to maintain the business side of things and my family side of things. Um, and it's very difficult, but you know, the family side of things gives meaning and context to so much else on like why you do what you do. And when I have mm. success and, and the family benefits from that, that feels so much better than just, I don't know, piles of cash in your living room. <laughs> like, I know that that seems like yeah, it would be cool, yeah. but, but there's no one to share that experience with, you know? And I'm, I'm, I would say doing something uh, by yourself, that's like one X, that's the experience. Doing it with a homie, you go on your trip, you know, did, you, you, that's like a shared experience. So that's like two X, right? You have something to share. You do something with your partner in life, like your wife, that's maybe like five times that experience. You do something with your family, your offspring, no matter what it is, you go to the park and, and that feels so much more important. And it's, so mm. when we went to Disneyland, this is actually a funny story. So we go to Disneyland, my daughter wants to go and that was a shit show, dude. Disneyland was really difficult as a father. I but fucking hate that there, place. <laughs> dude, the whole thing is designed for you to spend money. I don't understand. I spend all this money to get in there. And then it's just like, no, you got to keep spending money, bro. Small money. And, you know, and dude, so my chick, uh, when, I, <laughs> when I lived over there, I had this fucking girlfriend and she got me like a year pass to Disneyland for my birthday. And I was like, I fucking hate you. Like, like I just figured out that I fucking hate you. A, you got me a pass in Disneyland. B, you don't know me at all. And C, you fucking like this shit, so I don't like you. It was like the most telltale sign of like, oh, this relationship's going nowhere. Totally. Well, so, I mean, but <laughs> seeing my daughter have that experience, like, seeing my daughter's eyes there at Disneyland was was worth it. But what was funny is so... You know, we're driving through the night. We're in the RV. Uh, you know, the whole family is just like crashed out in the RV. They're having a good time. I'm stressing to the max. Like, am I going to get there? Like, what about? So we pull into this RV park. Uh, it's like midnight, right? I back in and I tell my wife like, hey, get the, you know, the connections out. So like plug us in, you know, you got like the shit hose and stuff. And so then I'm, I'm in the RV and all of a sudden she runs up and she's like, babe, I don't know what I did. Something's really wrong. And I'm like, what can be wrong? She's like, you have to get out here. So she was taking the hose out. It wrapped her on the handle for the shit release, pulls the shit release. I walk out and there's just shit Ugh. pouring everywhere. It's like, dude, and this is like a pavement. And I'm like, no, dude. And so then I close it. And then, so it's like one in the morning and I'm cleaning up shit uh, with like napkins, shit. dude. I like with napkins. Cause like, what oh. am I supposed to do? I almost thought like, well, what if I just drove off? What if I did? And there's like, it's full of RVs. So what if I just hop in and just like bounce and I just leave, you know, like obviously I couldn't do that, but, uh, it's just like, and then the kids are inside like all cozy, you know, sleeping just, and it's weird to think like what their experience is going to be like when they think back, Oh, Disneyland ripped. For me, it's like, bro, we yeah, like, yeah. went went bankrupt. I was cleaning shit. Like it was so difficult. Um, but you know, when you look back on those things, it's like it's about their experience, you know. So, anyways, we yeah. kind of went hard on parenting, but it's a good time. No, that's cool. I, hey, no, I'm I'm all for it. Um, one of the things, like, I guess it's one of the things that I'm thinking of uh, these days for me is like I'm going hard as fuck at the moment. Like, my life is about as hectic as it's ever been and it's like i'm up every day at 5 a.m 
and I'm trying to do my shit and I'm like, you know, this morning before I come here because we were away on the weekend um, doing the thing with Jack and then it's like I just got back. I had to work till 10 o'clock last night and then I had to get up at 5 a.m., make thumbnails, post this video. I had to come in here. The studio wasn't set up. I had to set up the hard drives. Ronan's out there editing the Jack Miller stuff. We're in here. But like it's just it's fucking relentless and it's like I signed up for it and I love it but there's a part of me that is you know it's kind of like what you sort of said before it's like you're doing all this shit and uh and yeah there's a part of me that's just like dude going hard is is really hard and you wonder like how much balance you should try and have but it's like oh and like you you're doing the same thing like you're going super fucking hard in a similar way you know like filmmaking and you're making you know this content and you're putting yourself out there you're also trying to be really good at the sport that you do um so i mean that whole like work life balance how hard should you go how hard do you go and and to me it's like i'm running at like eight percent of in my head what i could do and what i want to do and it's just yeah like that whole concept of like having a balance and like what you do this for is like that's become like something that i'm really trying to think about lately well dude let's go hard on balance because i i i want to make a book called like the unbalanced balanced life and i have this concept of like you can't have everything be equal right if you try to do everything Mm. all day everything's going to be shit Right. Like there's always an opportunity cost. So whatever you've ever done that's special in your life, you cut everything else out to focus on that one thing Mm. to get that one thing done. Yes. And so, yeah, your life at that moment was not balanced at all. But when you look at the whole year, then that's where it needs to be balanced. But it needs to be periodized. You need to have moments where you focus on your health. And, and your nutrition. You need to have moments where you focus on your sport and then you need to have moments where you focus on business uh, and then maybe f- family or relationships. But imagine if you were playing a video game and, and it gave you an option, what would you like to do? Like you're gonna spend this XP, you know, to, to upgrade your character. You wouldn't place these evenly across the board, right? You would just be like, hey, this is, I need, hella wood so i'm gonna make my guy a lumberjack i'm gonna max this out to 100 (laughs) you know like what right like if you were doing it in a video game you would do it in this way where you max out one thing at a time and but over that's so true you know yeah in a bigger picture it's balanced but when you're when you zoom in it's the most unbalanced it can be that's fucking a really really great way to describe it like the i've started thinking over the last couple of years um i've started thinking about my life in verticals so it's like i've got uh, i try and have like i think i've probably got like six or seven things i really should have five and it's like health and fitness uh is like one or like body and mind i guess i call it and then there's work and then there's uh motocross and then there's jujitsu reading and stretching so it's like that that's too much honestly and it's like yesterday i went surfing in the afternoon fucking love that would have loved to have gone this morning not possible would love to go tomorrow morning not possible got jujitsu tonight can't go so like you're so right like at every step of the way there's like this huge opportunity cost because as you dive in to do anything that means you cut ties for everything else for the mo- like for the time that you're spending doing that activity. So it's like when you're riding moto, it's like you're 100% in on riding moto and everything else in your life is getting completely neglected. So it just feels like this, this like constant uh, juggling act. And I think that, um, you know, that's where like priorities come into play in like it's such a huge way. And I've, I've, I, I feel like the busier that I've got and the more that I want to achieve, the less I have to do almost. It's like, you've kind of got to say no to uh, like, you know, surfing, for example, I fucking love surfing. I live 300 meters from the beach in some of the most beautiful beaches in Australia. And it's like, I just don't go. And it's like, you have to be okay with that and go like, okay, this is what I'm doing. This is, these are the goals. These are the priorities. Um, and, you know, not try and just do 
everything all the time because like there's no balance in that. But so like with that, what how I would look at that is I'm going to carve out a time sometime in the year where I'm going to go so hard on surfing and I'm going to soak up every bit mm. of that to make to make gains there. Right. Because you have if you look at so you said you look at your life in verticals, let's say you have your a vertical, which is you're putting a lot of your time and focus into and you're making gains there. You're actually progressing those verticals. You're making them taller. And then you have your B like priorities. Uh, but those are just maintaining. Right. So you're just you're just paying mm. the bills. Um, it, you're just getting by. It's just sort of on the back burner. And then you have your C priority stuff, which is those those are regressing you know you're losing like if you're so mm. jujitsu if that goes to a c priority and you don't go for two months you know yeah you've got time yeah. to focus on other things but when you get back you're going to be a little rusty right and so when do you how do you juggle that how do you move that around so that because if everything is just even if your verticals are all even you're never making gains on anything they're all just maintaining mm. and so with surfing super fucking hard you need you need back to back to back days to get really good at something you know what i mean and so yeah definitely like that's where you got to go hey i'm gonna go so hard on work that i can free up four or five days to just go surf my dick off mm. and and then i'm going to make gains on that and then so those gains now sort of like stabilize you 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 bump your vertical you 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 yeah, you're like lift your ceiling up. yeah and, and that's hard to do uh and you have to also look at a priority sometimes on just chilling. And so for me, mm. you know, the family side of things is where, because if I didn't have a family, I would be always trying to fill any dead space with something. And I, that's me. I, that's right. And so what I'm able to do is the dead space. I just exist with my family and they give me that time to sort of recharge and I can come mm. home to my wife and just lay my head in her lap and like my daughter's laughing, you know, and it's like, I'm, I'm able to sort of regroup and everything sort of has this moment of chill, but I still feel like I'm doing something like I'm still, okay. Mm. I, I, my vertical is, is raising with my family. Yeah. So then while the you're feeling like you're chilling. Yeah. So you need those times to sort of detach. Cause otherwise you just can't go full gas all the time or you just you're just gonna burn out you know and and like what's crazy is people sometimes traditionally look at it and be like well wait you're surfing you're you're rolling you know you're riding like you're doing all this cool shit your life rips bro okay yeah but <laughs> it's so hard to maintain that level of intensity <laughs> oh, dude. you know that yeah. it's not really like that and you need surfing or you need moto or you need jujitsu to just unplug the rest of your brain so that you even want to do the rest of the shit. And I have a question because I thought this was, you said like I'm operating at 8%. Like the average Joes that do above average things, I think have this thing where they have so much self doubt um, and, and can see or project what they could be doing and, and it never matches mm. up. Like I, just like you, I feel like at the busiest I can ever be, I'm maybe 10%. Like I could be going way harder. Mm. I know that when I'm taking a shit and I could not be taking a shit, I could be doing something else. I could be writing emails. I could be making pitches. I could, you know what I mean? So it's like throughout the day, really, if I broke it down, I'm, I'm lazy as, as shit. You know what I mean? And, but maybe that's not really the case. But so like you, you feel like, oh, I'm only 8%. So that keeps driving you, keep doing stuff because you feel like you're leaving so much on the table. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's that's pretty much, uh, yeah. And I, I just feel like you get like an opportunity, you know, like I've created an opportunity for myself to like do the things that I want to do, you know? And I think that like the weekend was a good example it's like we went away with jack miller and it's like we made this cool video and it's like that's something that that's the type of content that i've always wanted to make like i'm getting a chance to to do it now and it's almost like i feel there's been this and it it's, seems like a similar thing for you but it's been like this slow progression of 
you know, like I was in America for 10 years and I was filming and I was like honing my skills and creating this craft, but it sort of just didn't really work out the way that I thought it would. And then, and for whatever reason, you know, like there's a, a multitude of reasons why that's the case. But then, you know, you get home and you start the podcast and you like create this vessel for yourself. And so for me, it's almost just like, I'm finally getting a chance. Like what people are seeing from me now is like what I've always wanted to do, if that makes sense. But it's like, now I feel like, okay, you've got your fucking chance. Now, like actually do the thing that you said you wanted to do in a way. Well, so I I made this Instagram highlight story about like saying yes. And, uh, it's really, it seems so easy to say yes to opportunities when you talk about Mm. it, but there's so much risk and a lot of people before they say yes to anything, you know, so like with these impossible route, you know, with the, the first one, the big one. So we did, we did a prologue in Hawaii. Uh, it did well. Then I was able to pitch, um, like a proper season and get some like funding for this. Um, and, uh, but I had to say yes to that. Now it's like, Oh, so mm. you say yes to money and awesome opportunities. Okay. But what if I fail? I have to edit these videos. Mm. Like what if, what if we get out there and we crash or we have an issue and we don't do it. And now I'm, now I'm in debt to these sponsors. Like there's so much that could happen. I got to leave my family for a bunch of times. Like, you know, what if I look stupid? You know, there's all these things you start thinking about and then it's so much easier to not do something than to do something. Fucking <laughs> right. Nice. It's, yeah. And so like, but you just have to say yes. And then shit will work out or it won't. Who cares? You said yes to it. You have the opportunity. A thing will happen. An experience will exist. Time will move on. And that's that. And so you can't like worry too much about what the details are going to be. But if you never say yes, then nothing's going to happen. And so like, again, I'm not special. I'm not a good writer. You know, everyone that you've had sitting in this chair is such an on on another athletic level. Um, I'm not even the best at anything, right? I'm just, I guess, a jack of all trades, but not even that good. I'm not a good editor. I'm not a good filmmaker. I'm not a good writer. But I said, I say yes to shit. And then I just try to figure it out. And maybe sometimes Mm -hmm. it's not executed to where I want it to be. But who else is doing it? Who else was making these films? Well, is anyone else? And, and, and sorry to cut you off, but the, the thing is, is that, uh, and this is something that I've kind of learned is that people don't really know the picture that you've painted in your head. So like they see the end result and then they, people are stoked. Like they just don't know what else it could have been. You know, they don't, they don't see like where it lacked in your mind. And that, that was one thing that I've kind of really, I think I got over that quite a lot. Like I'd, I'd say if I had to like, rate why I probably didn't do as good as I could have when I was in America and I had that opportunity is because I was such a perfectionist in my own mind like just to a fucking crazy crazy degree and there's just like for me probably the thing is like I'm like I'm not that good at that much shit so I just want to like whatever I'm doing I'll just do it like as good as possible like with the podcast like this setup is so fucking elaborate like it's almost ridiculous it's like you could do the same thing way way easier and cheaper and you know but it's like to me i'm like no like i would like to do this thing just as good as it can possibly be done and it's never done right in my mind every like the white balance is a little bit off in the camera and i wish the highlights didn't clip just like you know so that's all the shit that but it only exists in your mind. I think as soon as I got over that, uh, I guess understanding that people really don't see what's completely in your mind. So they don't know that it's a failure in, in your own eyes. You know, they just see, yeah, the but point see I think that's, that's I think that's, I think that's the difference between someone who's like an average guy that's doing above average things is that they're, cause I have that exact thing. The, the death Valley video, what was in my mind was so much greater than what got produced, right? But there's just no way. Yeah. It's like it's an unobtainable level, you know? And sometimes that paralyzes me where I, I'm like, okay, I've got this yeah, idea yeah. for this intro and it's like this retro, like old school thing. And and then I start making it and I'm like, no, dude, it's not living up to the, the thing that's in my head. 
Uh, and so you always overreach. You always try to get to this impossible level and where other people, I think sometimes, and maybe this, like I have a lot of self doubt and I, and I, I just, I don't have a lot of confidence. If you had a lot of confidence, if you were very, very like proud of what you do, you might put out a piece of shit and be like, dude, that's so good. <laughs> you know, but it's like yeah, objective. Yeah. It's not very good, but because you think you did something so amazing, I always think there's room for improvement. And that that's like, again, with you, it shows like what you've done here. You know what I mean? And I come in here and I'm like, bro, this is the most futuristic setup I've ever seen. But for you, you're like, yeah, but I wish our chairs like came up from the ground and there was like LED lights that said your name. You know, like there's probably yeah. something in your head that yeah. you yeah. wish was there, but I don't see that. I'm just like, this is dope. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's the, that's, it's like that whole paralysis by analysis saying, you know, like, and I think that I definitely experienced that, um, a bunch in the past and, and it's, it's like the same with training, you know, I'm sure that there's been times where when you like really first got into cycling and you wanted to like get good at cycling every time you're on the bike, like you're not as fit as you want to be. I think that that same kind of paradox exists in almost like every avenue in life. And, it's funny like then you know you start to for me anyway like learning a lot about like the meditation side of things and uh getting into that whole world it's just like what that is is just like this set point deviation that is just like necessary to like push you forward as a human it's like we've we've got these like varied set points that essentially push us forward to you know survival of the fittest type shit and it's like, okay, there's this sexual drive set point. There's the hunger set point. There's the tired set point. There's the um, achievement set point. There's all of these things. And it's almost like just giving in to the fact that it's like, okay, all this really is like this urge for me to like fucking do whatever it is that I'm, you know, wanting to do, whether it's like get better at jujitsu or, you know, what do good with work. It's like all that is is just like this internal you know biological thing where the set points just have to get moved like you're never uh that it's biologically doesn't make sense for you to just be okay across the board like what's the there's really no i guess like evolutionary benefit for that and i think that maybe there's like having that insight a little bit can like almost take the pressure off yourself in a way um and i think that's prob that's probably what i've been trying to do is just like just chill a little bit it's just you know you chase it's just like this dragon that you chase and if you can understand that it is a dragon you're never going to get there it sort of makes it okay to just like do your best totally but you're chasing it and eventually you find yourself in a pretty amazing place and i think a lot of people are afraid to chase it but what so you talk about meditation so like okay I think a lot of people it's changing now because of moto guys getting into cycling. But a couple years ago, a dude in a spandex riding some goofy little skinny tired bike. That's not cool. Right. Like, they, like there is no, Oh, yeah. that's the, the softest thing you can do. But, uh, when I'm on the bike, I'm, I'm in a form of meditation. Uh, when I'm climbing yeah. some major mountain and I'm huffing and I'm puffing, it's like, it's almost literally step by step on how to get into a meditation state where, you know, you get mm. sort of hypoxic to a point where you can't let thoughts in, right? You're like, and obviously you can't be going full gas and super hard because that's, you know, whatever, but you get into this one zone, like zone three, where there's not enough oxygen in your brain to like, let it fill you with all these thoughts. Uh, and then all you're doing is focusing on your breathing and then you're just this ball of consciousness floating up this mountain. And so that that is, I think, something that no one ever talks about on how beneficial cycling is to your mental health. That there's times where you can just mm. completely be in your own universe. Um, you know what I mean? And it's and it's and so every day I have a form of meditation on the bike where it's just me alone in my brain listening to my lungs. And I mean, that's, that's something really special. And I think that that's why cycling becomes so addictive to people is that they, they chase that. Yeah. They, they want more of it. They want that time by themselves. And then you like that time. So then you keep getting more and more and more of it. So then I'm, I go out and I'll do five, six, seven hour rides, 
you know, we did race across the West. That was 46 hours, 38 minutes. Like that was probably too much riding. <laughs> you know, I told, that, that, that was a bit much, <laughs> but you know, it's like, there's, it was there's, a lot. there's points where, you know, you just, you have the self-reflection, the ideas that come to you, like the pathways that open up in your brain are so amazing. But so then today we went up, um, uh, Mount Baldy. And so then me and, and my two buddies, Tim and Travis, we are going 50 miles an hour on skinny tires, passing cars. Like we caught up to this Harley going through this tunnel. Dude, we are on that. We're like racing street bikes, right? But we're in spandex, bro. We're not wearing no like full leathers. Like, and then we're carving turns. And so I know that sometimes people are like, oh, that's, that's weak. And that's soft. Just get a moto. I mean, ride all the bikes. I, tomorrow we're going to go race street bikes at Chichula Raceway, like, um, dragging some knees, you know, like whatever. I just want to ride all the bikes, but you know, there's cycling can be so much for so many people. It just depends on what you want out of it. And I, I think that it's really cool that a lot of the moto guys are getting into it. Um, because then it makes it, it makes it look cool, uh, versus maybe, you know, a few years ago, it didn't, it didn't look that cool. Yeah, dude, there, there's a crazy level of respect that I have for people that are like hardcore into into cycling because you're just putting yourself in that cave and it's like, it's so fucking hard to, to mentally prepare yourself to just like go there. But it's like, it becomes a practice. Like, you know, I think meditation's a the same thing like it's a practice it's a you you're trying to put yourself in this place that's like quite hard to get to like you don't have the the physical pain barrier i guess that that you have to break through um on a cycle bike and i mean it's something that i've put so much thought into um i guess things just like come together at the right time like when it comes to like meditation and like jujitsu and all that shit and I've, i've spoke about it a bunch of times but it's like what you said something at the very start. I just didn't want to like dive into it straight away. But um, you were like, I've got these two voices in my head. I've got like the positive me, the negative me, and then the me. And then it's just like, when you really look at that, it's like, and, and basically what you said was like, all right, how about if I just get all of these to like work together, then I could get up this hill. And it's like, that is everything right there that you need to know about like your experience as a human it's like you're just being delivered these thoughts from fucking completely nowhere but it's a voice in your head that's like very familiar it feels like you it sounds like you it's consistent with the way that you've thought before and all the you know the experiences that you've had and we take that to be you but it's not you like the you is the person that is the you is not the, not the person but the you is the thing that's there before all the thoughts it's the the space in which those thoughts can even permeate and it's like that's the person that gets up the hill it's not the negative voice or the it's not the positive voice that gets up the hill it's like there's a physical thing that's there that's the one that gets up the hill and we're not the voices that are in our head and when you get into like that zone you talk about in cycling like there is no voice in the head there, there's no there's no like cognizant decision making that goes into you turning your legs over at x amount of rpm and moving your weight gradually to to turn this bike up or down the hill and the the body like all that is just unconscious like that's just happening um without the you know the voices and the you that you think that there is and you know for me like that i've had that a bunch of times you know cycling and and on motos and surfing and all that sort of shit but you know for me it become like really 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 obvious in jiu-jitsu and then that came at the same time as i was like really getting into meditation then so you start to realize what's kind of actually going on and then it sort of lets you just like you you know you can just get it you just go there every day you just know what that place is you know how to get there and you there's almost like a part of you knows that that's like what you actually are and it's like when you're going out on the bike it's like you're actually just getting to be yourself for sure but though but understanding where that information is coming from is is hard to to separate right so when you're getting signals and input from your body 
and then you kind of think that maybe that's your own thoughts. It's, it's, it's really weird. It's really weird when you're like, oh, I feel this certain way, but that's not actually my thought. That's just my body trying to tell me something. That's like, it's a natural mm. alarm, you know, saying, hey man, you're... It's the model trying to inform the agent. Right, right. Um, and so, you know, with there's there's certain things that I think every person should do in life or just dabble in. One, I think, is jujitsu. I think every m- male definitely should at least do a year of jujitsu because of how much it breaks down your ego. When you go in and there's some 65 year old, you know, banker and he just rolls you into a pretzel yeah. and there's nothing you can yeah. do about it. That that changed how I walked through the world. And it's always so weird when you see people puff their chest out and like want to fight and they're like, oh, you know, get all rowdy. And then you see him get knocked out or like start to fight. And you're like, bro, you don't know how to fight. Why did you want to fight so bad? <laughs> You know, like you don't, uh, that's weird. Uh, but when you are kind of practicing killing someone every day, all day, cause that's what it is. You know what I mean? You choke someone out and then they tap and you stop. But what if you were a caveman fighting for your gazelle, you're going to throw this dude in the rear naked yeah. and you're not going to let go, <laughs> you know, like you're going to kill this person. Yeah. And so you're practicing this and it's such a primal thing where it's just too people coming together and kind of just clashing in this in this because there's almost no other martial arts where you can go a hundred percent every day yeah right like you can't kickbox you can't kick someone in the head as hard as you can every day right but with jujitsu you pretty much can go a hundred percent and then you start to feel what your body is really capable of and then you see all these signals when a dude's like, you know, side mount and it's like hairy bellies in your face and you're like, can't breathe and like sweats dripping in your eyes. You feel this like visceral reaction to like fight or flight and then to feel mm. w- w- what you choose, right? Because we always think we're going to be the hero of our own story until some shit happens and we flight, right? We don't fight or we mm. don't, we don't do what we thought we were going to do. Uh, we always think we know what we're going to do, but jujitsu is one of those things where you get to practice that you get to be put in a situation where you fail over and over and over again. until you get comfortable in the fire, right? You're just rolling in the fire and then you're, you're fine there. And I think that t- taking that, you don't even have to get that good. Like literally one year, just, just a like two striped white belt has so many valuable skill sets that anyone who's never done jiu-jitsu just doesn't have yeah no definitely when, when did you in the whole like it's pretty interesting to hear your like whole story uh, i mean obviously there's so much more but in terms of like being so young and then you know doing the bike shop thing and then it's just like kind of rich broke rich broke and w- when did jiu-jitsu kind of like enter your life in that whole kind of timeline yeah it was after the uh, motor shop fell apart. I got fat and, um, because I was riding all the time and I, anyways, I just got heavy and I had a buddy who would ride motos and he would always tell me like, Hey dude, I go to this, you know, I go to hoist Gracie jujitsu. Like you should come and check it out. Uh, and you know, I don't, I've never had any fight com like combat sport history. You know, I mean, I did karate when I was like, whatever, five. And I think I like threw up on the mat and then I never went back, <laughs> you know, like, like I just never had that. You, that that want to fight someone um but when i got there and i started realizing that there was like a sport aspect to it i don't know i mm. i i connected with the idea of jiu jitsu almost instantly i i i just felt there there's like a flow like you call it like a flow like the way your arms move mm. and the way you connect with someone and, and the pressure you put it's so weird but when you're just watching two guys roll around, you're like, okay. Uh, but when you're there in it and you're like clamping your elbow down, that just feels good for some reason, you know, you're, and you're like stabilizing this other human and you're making them do what you want to do. And then it's this chess, obviously, you know, but like it's this crazy chess match where I'm trying to set up a move 15 moves down the road. 
I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this and you're going to counter and then I'm going to counter and then we're going to roll there and then I'm going to get to this position and all of a sudden I get to this spot and I slip it. Shit. Start over. You know what I mean? And then now we kind of keep doing. And, and so, yeah, so I went in, I started doing jujitsu. I, I had nothing else going on in my life. And so I was going all the time and just got really yeah. good at it. Um, started doing all the seminars, you know, going to, to, to hoist Gracie seminars, Rodrigo seminars. Um, we would travel, started doing competitions, you know, and, uh, well, something that's really interesting that I still think about today, um, it wraps back to kids is that Hoyce was doing a seminar and someone asked him what w- it must've been a complete nightmare to be a kid in the Gracie family. Uh, you guys must have mm. so much pressure and it must just be a d- brutal. And they said, no one was allowed to train until you were 12 years old. You, you could not train, but you would play games. So they, as a kid, a, a Gracie kid, they would put you on the back and it was like, ride the bull, right? So you try to shake them off. Mm. Everything was a game. Like, okay, we got to like, that's do cool. this. Yeah. And, and, and say so he set all these games out on how their family operated until 12. So to build this passion, now you're still learning technique, right? You, you get on the back of the yeah. bull and you put your hooks you're in your you, own technique, right? Yeah. And, but you're, you're the environment that you're put in is positive. It's, it's put under a light of yeah. let's go have fun. But once you turn 12, okay, now your name is Gracie and you got to murder people. Right. And so, like, but, it, yeah. but, it, but it gave you this, this, it gave them, uh, I think the point to want to do this. And a lot of times I think we put our kids into positions where it's like, we just shove them in, like we shove them through the door. They have to walk through that door. Mm. And, and there's no matter, no matter how skilled the kid is or talented the kid is or whatever, like they got to walk through that door. And, and that kind of comes from that, you know, that, that start. But anyways, that was just like a really, it's something I always think about what, but, uh, what Hoyce had said. And then, so I did, I, I was, I started teaching kids and adults, right? So, cause I was making like no money. And so then I was like, well, let me just, I don't want to pay to train. So let me teach for free, you know, teach in, in trade for my mm. membership. So then I started teaching and what was crazy when I started teaching the kids um, you learn technique in such a different way because you have to explain it. Yeah, and so yeah, this is this is just something in general for all life. If you can explain a concept to a five year old who's hyped on sugar, you understand that concept very well, right? And so you have to like start thinking about how you're going to communicate. And that's weird. Like you ask pros or like really high level athletes, like you're, how do you do that? And they're like, I don't know. I don't know how I do it. Like they can't articulate that. And it's weird because like, so AJ Catanzaro, right? Has this new academy. Like AJ has a way to convey uh, information so mm. well that he can, te- he can teach to a higher level than he can ride. And that's not, I'm not slamming yeah. him, right? He's an awesome dude. I'm just saying like, th- but then you might have someone that's such a high level like Tomac if you asked him how to do something, he, he's just like his personality is a potato. Like you do, I, he can't tell me how to do anything, but he can ride the shit out of the bike. Right. And so there's just this level of like, how do you communicate versus, and then there's not always equal to the level that you're at. Uh, but anyway, so I'm teaching these kids, I'm teaching adults. Um, then I started getting paid at the gym. Then I was there like six days a week. Um, and then I got my, my blue from hoist. Then I won a grappler quest tournament. Um, that was, that was really cool. I went to worlds. I broke a dude's arm. Oh, sick. Um, and that was crazy. It was like a smokers tournament. So like you're in a cage with gloves, but you can't punch in the face. And, uh, I ran through all these, these dudes. I was, I was doing really well. And then the last guy, he was like a brawler. And so then he just, he had no real skills. And uh, I don't even know how he got into this tournament, but so then I did like a standing Kimura and then I, I was going to like roll him. That was like my takedown, but he didn't, he didn't roll. He just face planted into the mat and then never tapped. And so then I just broke his shoulder and it was like, 
dude, it was so disgusting. Um, feeling that in my hand was like pretty gnarly. Uh, and so, so anyways, uh, then I got my purple under hot Rigo, which I remember you had to roll with him before he gave you the belt. And so I'm tr- dude. Yeah. At the time I'm the best jujitsu dude I've ever been. Like I, I know this game so well. I'm teaching classes like I'm on top of my shit. And Rodrigo literally spins me like a fucking helicopter into a triangle. And I'm just like, I, there's nothing I can do. I, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how, what I, like all my knowledge was for nothing because everything I was going to do, he already know. Oh yeah, I know you're going to do that. So I'm going to stuff that. And he played with me like I was a doll. And, uh, and I was like, well, I'm definitely not going to get my purple. Like he literally helicoptered me, dude, <laughs> you know? And so then, but he did, he gave me the purple and it was really cool. Um, but, uh, then I went to worlds for purple and to get to the weight, cause you have to weigh in right before you get on the mat. Um, and I was trying to yeah. weigh in at 155. And so then that's kind of how I segued into cycling is like, well, I need it. I need another sport to help me get my weight down. And so then I started riding bikes to manage my weight. And then I went to worlds. The hype is so high. I, I've trained so hard and I got this guy. I, I I'm on his back, but he, ha- I have one of his arms trapped with my leg. Okay. So I'm yeah. great. Like I'm on his back, but I have one of his arms trapped. They didn't give me the back position points cause his arm was. Oh uh, yeah. There. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and then so I was like, what the hell do you, this is a better position, <laughs> you know? Um, I, yeah. I had him on the run the whole time and then they gave him an advantage point because his coach was Brazilian and the ref was Brazilian. And so then dude, I lost, I like literally cracked and lost all motivation to roll that one moment. Like I, everything was on this one match. I was feeling so good and for it to kind of be robbed from me. And then the fact that, and like this kind of goes all into like competition jujitsu or whatever, but you know, the points, that's not really jujitsu. Like you can just take someone down and be a wrestler and hold them there. And then that, but that's not really the vibe. Like that's not the point of this, you know what I'm saying? And so anyways, I, I kind of fell out of it, uh, pretty hard and then just sunk myself into, but I had something else to segue into. So then I got super into cycling. Yeah. 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 Fuck. That's a crazy journey to and to Yeah. To go to worlds and shit too. And you were, you were young, so it wasn't, uh, so it was like not masters worlds or anything like that. No. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, I was like 25, maybe 26 when I went. So, you know, yeah, it was, I mean, it's a dude. And so then, yeah. So I think everyone should do jujitsu. That was really cool. I think that, um, everyone should ride a road bike at some level to understand how to pace yourself. Right. So like most Mm. moto guys, like just going out to most amateur moto guys, what's the hardest thing for them to do is to pace themselves because you have no metric. You don't have a power meter. You can't look at your heart rate. Yeah. You're on the gate, you're on the gate and you're just, and then you're 190 beats per minute for the first minute. And so then what happens to your arms? They explode. Right. Yeah. Uh, but when you ride road bikes, what you're able to do is is find where your body can exist and and what level that is. And you know how long you can bang off the rev limiter for and how there's no way mm. you can do a one lap sprint and hold that pace. So maybe don't, you know, like go as hard as you can for the first lap and then fade. Um and so I think that riding bicycles really helps with the moto side because then you understand how to pace. Like I know without any metrics how my body feels. And then so I don't ever get arm pump. I never get arm pump because I don't mm. put my heart rate to max. Uh, my legs now are decently strong. So I'm able to squeeze the bike. I'm able to, to kind of float with my arms a little bit. And look, I'm not like a good moto rider at all, but I'm just saying when I used to ride motos all the time, that's all I did. I was worse, yeah, yeah. but, but now, you know, with the cycling background, it's, it makes motos more enjoyable. I can go out and do like a 20 minute moto and, and I'm not tunnel visioned. My arms aren't cramping up. It's fun. And when you can do things 
Like jujitsu gives you a really good perspective on life and your ego as just a human. Uh, and then, you know, cycling can give you this ability to pace yourself really, really well. You know, you can start enjoying other things in life more to, to, a, to a higher level, right? Like surfing or motos or whatever. If you don't have the fitness and the way to pace and the mindset, you might get yeah. a couple minutes you know, but what do we want to do? We want to do it all day. I want to ride motos all day. I, and so the more I can do that, I don't know, the more I, I can enjoy that sport. Yeah, no, that, that makes total sense to me. So with the, the cycling, um, as a guy that rides moto, uh, but is like super proficient when it comes to cycling and like in that world, what are pro moto guys getting out of cycling? Cause that's like probably one of the, foundational uh parts of any pro moto dudes program uh well i mean so i'm not alden baker so i don't know exactly what their program is but i would say that one they're able to maintain a high level of fitness uh while not riding right because you start hearing a lot of these big guys they only might ride two days a week during race season right because it's just it's takes a toll on the body. Like you can't ride motos all the time, just like kickboxing. You can't kick someone in the face all day, every day. So how do you, what do you do to maintain a level of, of fitness? And you can get in the gym and that's cool. But to be honest, the more muscle mass you have, the more energy to maintain that you, right? And so you yeah, can't yeah. just be like this yoked dude on a moto because then you just don't have that 20 minute uh, effort in you, right? Because you have so much mass in you. Anyway, so that you're able to maintain a, a higher level of fitness with basically no impact to your body. You're not running on your knees. It's very low impact. It's very easy on your whole body. And then riding bikes is cool, right? So, I mean, I, I know that if you've never ridden a road bike, it probably seems lame as shit, but it's not. It's actually really fun. Um, and so then, you know, I wanted to ride motos all the time, but I lost everything. I sold my bikes. They were too expensive. The only thing I could do was ride a bicycle. And so that kind of gave me that, that, that itched that, that scratch. Right. And so, Mm. um, so then also it's a totally different world, but sort of similar. So then you can help prevent burnout, right? Like Mm. Ricky Carmichael is a very special breed and he always talked about how many laps he ran over and over and over and over and over again. But if you could do something where you don't have to do that all the time and you can sort of like maybe go mountain biking, like you're still going to sort of exercise those those skill sets. But now you're doing something new. Your mind is fresh. And, you know, Ryan Villapoto, I think he had said one time his career might have been longer if he had switched bike brands, you know, just a change of scenery. And that change of scenery Mm. with like a road bike or mountain bike is so easy. You ride out your door and the scenery changes. Right. And I know it's a not exactly what he was talking about but so the mental health moto or or cycling is great you know um you're able to to maintain a high level of fitness kind of almost year round and then the pacing the pacing is so important so like especially at the high level guys they're able to know well i can't just go a hundred percent off the gate and and then expect to hold that all the way to the finish right they're gonna Mm. they're going to exist in a zone and then like attack at the end. And a lot of moto guys have actually got into like racing and like Zwift and doing things where there's like a, a race aspect where you have to manage your energy and your fueling and all this stuff and then end with a big effort. And there's just something about how you learn how your body dispenses energy uh, that is really valuable mm. for any sport. It doesn't matter. I mean, like, did you have NASCAR well, I think guys life in general too? Just, just, just in general in life, you know, like just learning. Like, I think that the, the more you sort of said it before, but it's like the more fit that you become across the board, it's like, you can just slowly, like really, like we got a funny saying like that we say, it's like, you can just get up and you just suck the day's dick. Like you've just got everything in the tank to just go out and fucking make it happen you know so it's like yeah just having that like lifting your own baseline constantly it just almost like lets you take on more um more of the day every day for sure but it's an investment of time you got to put that time into it and 
you know, what happens is like you to get good at riding, to enjoy riding, you kind of have to ride a lot like cycling. Mm -hmm. Um, We rode Mount Baldy. We went up to the top of this mountain. Um, At this point in my fitness, uh, I had a lot of fun. Oh, that's up near L.A., right? Yeah, we we rode out from Rialto. Like Pomona? Uh, Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so... um, Yeah, okay. So I had a really fun day. Uh, But objectively, if someone else, if like I just took some guy who's never been on a road bike and we went the same pace, this guy's heart would explode and he would hate everything, right? Um, Or Mm. he doesn't even make it to the top, so then he doesn't get that feeling of reward. So it takes time, you know what I mean? It takes time to, to, to work into it, but... The fitter you are, the the more enjoyable it is. And again, like I get shit sometimes. People are like, dude, road cycling is the dumbest thing ever. Get a mountain bike. It's like, I have a mountain bike and I love it. Oh, well, get a moto. I have a moto. I love it. Like, I don't, Mm -hmm. I just want to ride all the bikes. Like you don't have to, you don't have to pigeonhole yourself in one thing. Um, And you don't have to also hate another person for liking a slightly different bike, you know, like, dude, it's bikes. Mm. Everyone loves bikes. The feeling is the same, uh, pretty much. Right. And again, if you can get kind of good at one thing, then you, you learn the fundamentals, you learn the fundamentals of how to take a new sport, progress through it, have the, like the shark tooth type thing where you make some gains and then you lose some, and then you make some gains and then you lose some. And as long as you trend upwards, then you're good. Mm. But that, that teaches you a lot about life in general. And so like, yeah, to kind of loop it back to the impossible route stuff. So we've done five Hawaii, death Valley, Virginia, uh, Montana, and Colorado. We did four of them in one year, which was way too much. And then which these are impossible routes because they've never been done by anyone before. Like that's the premise. We're going to do a route that no one's ever done before. We may not finish, we don't know what's out there. We're going to go out there and we're just going to give her the berries. Uh, we did that. Plus, then I did 12 Hours of Road America. I did Race Across the West. I did a handful of other race races, like Unbounds, a 200-mile gravel race. Anyways, like, I've done a bit too much this year. But all of it all stems from a certain mindset that I learned at Death Valley, which was that day one was so difficult and so hard and I was put in this position of like deer in the headlights I was like I have bitten off way too much because I I with the help of Jeremiah uh Bishop you know he put together this this route and he, he, t- he hit me up and he was like hey man this is like I'm good and this looks like a lot he's like do you want to make this route shorter and at that time I'm thinking as the editor as the director, as the person who's going to produce this film and put it on my channel. It's like, no, dude, make it easier. No, let's make it as hard as we can. Mm. But then when I'm the guy existing in that, I'm like, dude, past me is such an asshole. Uh, And so now I'm having to do it. And I'm put in this position where now we have a whole film crew there. We've got the best, the best photographers, the best videographer, all this money is put into this. Everyone, we put it on social media. I can't fail. Mm. I cannot fail. And it got I got to a point where it's like, oh dude, this is the limit of my body. I cannot go past this. But since I had no option, I could not get in the car. I mean, I guess I could have, but then I got to make that video. I got to make the video of me failing and and Jeremiah mm. being the hero. No, it's not going to happen, dude. I I'm not going to have to edit me getting in a car and quitting. And so this like mindset shift where it's just take it one mile at a time, sometimes even less than that. Dude, just get to that rock up the way and then Mm. reevaluate your life when you get to that rock. Okay, now I'm at this rock. This rock's stupid. Let's get to that tree. And then now we're at that tree. Let's get to this corner. And you just limp yourself through and what was so amazing about Death Valley was it was seven days. You can fake it for one day. You can go deep. You can empty your tank. Cool. You know, next day you have a beer, you sit on the couch. I had to wake up at five in the morning. You know what I mean? And do it all over again. And so like 
Every, but here's the thing is that the team that we had, they were all so good and they didn't question. They just got up. They did their mm. job. They cooked the oatmeal. They got the bikes ready. They filled the bottles. You know, they, they took the pictures. They charged the batteries. Okay, well, if you're doing your job, then I got to do my job. And so I, I'm put in a situation where I cannot fail. And what ended up happening was that I saw that whatever you think your limit is to your body, it's, it's not just around the corner, dude. It is, it is not even within view. Like you don't really know mm. what the limit of your body is. And, and that's for good purpose. Like your body doesn't want you to kill itself because you could, if you could somehow unclick out of your mind, that connection, you could just rev your heart to a million and die. Right. And so like there is, there's a purpose to your body giving you these signals. That's and you have gods. Yeah. Right. And, and so just like with a rev loader on moto, you, you don't want to take that off. You know what I mean? Uh, but you want to know that that sweet spot where can i go how hard can i go and you'll never know that until you go there and so then i go through this experience in death valley where i mean i just like astroplaned into the future where this was done and i it was kind of a bummer because to have the mindset to keep going i had to live in the future where it was done so much that i was never in the moment mm. So I, I almost don't have really any memories of the trip. Like I look back at the pictures, I look at the videos and I'm like, dude, I don't even remember being there because I wasn't, my body was there, but my mind mm. was fucking out of there. And so then, mm. you know, we were just, everything's so hard. It's so difficult. And, you know, then we get to the, the final day we're rolling in and like, I am ecstatic. I cannot believe that I've done something because I'm not. I wouldn't consider myself an athlete. I'm a filmmaker that rides bikes. But in this moment, I was an athlete. I just did something that no one else, no other human has done, right? And that's crazy. Just as an average guy who's not special, I'm not a Red Bull athlete or whatever. I just did something that no one else has ever done. So I'm on the fucking high of my life, dude. And the 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 whole trip, I had been hiding these emotions and, and pulling them down because... I don't know if I'm going to finish or not, right? I don't want to celebrate too early. And so we're, we're done. We're rolling into town. We're closing up shop. We do the end of the exit interviews and we go back to the RV. It's done, bro. I did it. And Bijou, this, uh, he's an amazing chef. He's filming we with the cell phone. And bro, I had been playing bikes for seven days, skidding in the dirt, having a good time. And I just didn't really, I don't know. I lost my, my bearings. I skidded cause he was filming. I was like, I'm going to do this sick whip skid to finish this off. Literally I'm stopping this huge 52 hour, seven day impossible route. And I just, all of a sudden I'm flying through the air and I'm like, what is happening, dude? I've never felt this before. And I smacked the ground and I, I'm like, dude, I broke my leg. I broke my femur and everyone's like Fuck. laughing because it wasn't a big like it was a slow crash, right? It wasn't, wasn't a big deal. Um, but the problem is that when you have speed, then like the horizontal speed takes away from the vertical impact. This was a hundred percent vertical impact to my greater trochanter, my femur, which at this point, 52 hours and seven days, I have zero body fat on me, right? So it's just a bone and mm. skin and pavement. And, um, I was laying there going and everyone's like, dude, get up, like walk it off. And I was like, no dude, something's wrong. And so I went from the highest of highs that I've just accomplished something so amazing to that. I broke my fucking femur in the parking lot of a taco bell. <laughs> you know what I mean, dude? Like, and, and that was probably one of the hardest things to deal with. Like I actually thought so much about time dilation, like how, can I go in the past? Can I change time? Can I port my consciousness before this? Like I really thought about like, I hate that time can't stop or rewind. Like I'm just on this ocean of time and I made a decision and, and it, I had to just ride it. Just like if you're surfing, you can't go, I don't like this wave. I'm going to just surf to the other wave. You got to finish out that wave, yeah. you know? And, and sometimes maybe it's a shitty wave, but you just, anyways, 
uh, then it was like, I just did the greatest thing I've ever done in my life to now I'm feeling the worst I've ever felt in my life. And so to combine those two mindsets, like I had just done something where it's like, okay, put your head down. All you got to do is make it to the finish seven days. Cool, cool, cool. Now I get there and like, oh, now I got to basically do this again for six to eight weeks. You know what I mean? Like now I got to be in the mental suck for six to eight weeks. I don't even get to celebrate. Mm. And so then um, my boy Travis, actually, he drove me to the hospital. They were like, yeah, you're fucked. And then so I, um, he had to drive me all the way back home and I was laying in the back. And so what happens is like the greater trochanter is like the big bulb on the side. And then my uh, hip flexor is attached to that. And so if you even mm. think about your hip flexor, it pulls the bone off of your femur. And so then I was like mm. laying in the back of the RV and I fell asleep for a second and I jolted and I forgot that I had a broken oh. leg and like to the pain. So then I get home and my wife, dude, she's a trooper, right? She's not complained at all, but she has two kids that are just crushing her. And all she is in the mental suck of like, I can't wait till Tyler gets home and then he can take the kids. You know, I can have a break. And I roll up and I'm like, babe, you got to wipe my ass for six to eight weeks. <laughs> you know, like you have to wait on me hand and foot. And, and, and so then my daughter like came in the RV and uh, at the time I was, I hadn't really processed the emotions. And then my daughter hugged me and she hugged me in a way I might cry. <laughs> uh, she hugged me in a way that just made me completely melt into her. Like that she loved her dad so much and she had no idea what I did. Like she didn't know my, I was hurt. She just missed me. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. she hugs me and she's hugging me so good. And I just, I broke down, dude. I just started bawling my eyes out. And, and so, yeah, then like I had to, then I had to go and edit past me being a superhero while current me is pay shit. You know what I mean? And so like, yeah. it was really difficult. Then I got all of this shit online. So it was like this, this trifecta of just how to deal with mental fuckery, like 101. And mm. that, that experience in its, in its whole thing just changed my life, man. It just completely changed my life. And if I can do that, I can, I can do anything. Like you just have to put one foot in front of the other, put your head down, keep going, You'll move through space. Time will pass. Life will rip. Yeah, dude, it, it's a crazy story. It's a it's a crazy achievement. And I think uh, I guess to kind of like um, maybe add a little bit of my own context onto that, like that's one of the things that I just think about all the time. Is like, just look at your watch. The those seconds are just going forwards, and it's just constant. This relentless. Like time does not give a fuck. And it's like at some point, like your watch will stop. And I think that's the thing that is in my head so much. Like, you know, the last kind of like five or six years, it's like, you're going to fucking die, dude. Like you will be dead so quick. So far in the, like in the whole cosmic fucking scheme of things, it's like you're dead already basically. <laughs> and it's like fucking do something, man. Like their time is ticking, bro. And you ain't getting it back. So it's, uh, pretty cool to you know hear a story like that and and the effect that you know it had on your life like it, it can be like such a transformative experience but it's it, it to go right right to go back to the opportunity i had this opportunity and i said yes to it not knowing what the result was going to be and again it kind of worked out i guess <laughs> uh there, there's this I don't know if you've heard this. Adam Cincerolio actually had posted it and I'd heard it before, but it was like the Chinese farmer where it's like, maybe right. Uh, mm, his horse yeah. leaves and everyone's like, Oh, that's a bummer. Your horse left. And it's like, well, maybe, but then the horse brings other yeah. horses back and they're like, that's sick. And he's like, well, maybe then, then his horse, then his son breaks his leg on a horse. And it's like, Oh, that sucks. It's just good or bad. It, it doesn't matter. It's just, it's just moving on to the next thing. You're just going to ride this rhythm section. You know what I mean? And you're just going to, you're going to be up, yeah. you're going to be down, but that's life. And, and so what's better 
to to ride the rhythm section or to watch other people ride the rhythm section. Even if you come up short and you freaking flip over the bars, at least you have an experience of it. At least you know what it's like. Yeah. Versus just watching it. You know what I mean? Um, you just got to get out there and do it. And I think that that's why I hit you up is because when we were, when I'm watching your podcast, I'm listening to you because dude, I'm riding bicycles for hours and hours and hours and hours. And so I got to listen yeah. to something, right? Like my brain is going to explode. So I just listen to these long form podcasts and, you know, just hearing all the things you talk about. It's like, why is this guy so similar to me? but we live on the opposite ends of the world and we're sort of like completely disconnected in industries, but our, our path is similar minus I really like to eat plants and I have a family and this guy's, you know, I got a few things that's different than me, but it doesn't matter. Like we kind of are the same. And I think there's a lot of people like that, but they don't have the platform. Yeah, totally. They don't have the platform to find other people like that. You know, they just sort of sometimes think they're alone in what they like or how they they exist in the world. And so, like, the more people that can be open, like you were talking about books, bro, I hate books. Books can suck it. But when I heard you talk about books, I was like, fuck, I guess I should probably read a book. Because, dude, I've read one book, and that was What's Beneath the Sink by R.L. Stein. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, goosebumps. No shit. Like it, dude, it's not, not a, I just have a very hard time reading. I like listening. I like bringing in information, but that was something when I heard you talk about that, I was like, that's, that's a hole in my life. And if he's gaining benefit from it and you're not, you're not like promoting books are on a crazy level or whatever. You're just saying how you, ex what your experience is, right? You are saying I do this and, and I get this result and it's like, well, I want that result. You know what I mean? I, I, I want to have that other, that knowledge. I want to expand my brain. Um, and so if you're doing it, maybe I'll give it a shot. And maybe I give it a shot and I think it's stupid and I hate it, but at least I know that I gave it a shot. Now I have a better context of what I actually like or don't like. But maybe I start reading and it changes my life. And maybe I go, oh, dude, reading is really amazing. And I almost didn't read books uh, out of what? Out of fear. Or I don't even know why I don't. I don't have a reason I don't. But now that like you put that out there, I might do something that completely forks my life in another path that's super beneficial. Yeah, it's um it's funny. Uh it's funny you say about, you know, like, oh, where I'm like you, you're like me. Dude, so many people are, are so similar. And that's probably been one of the things that I've learned the most through this podcast is like fuck dude we've watched the same races we've watched the same read the same magazines we've you know like there's so many inputs that have been the same that create like these kind of the thoughts and the you know they start to like mold who you are and like the identity sort of stuff like i'm a cyclist i'm a this i'm a that um and i think that yeah people people probably don't have the access to uh I guess the the different people on this like like your like your story is fucking insane the things that you've been able to go through and you know there's probably a ton of people that have gone through these you know like similar experiences but that yeah they do feel alone in that so I think that's probably been just one of the coolest parts about doing the podcast in general it's just like sharing people's stories having people it resonate with certain people and just drawing like that little bit of inspiration like there's so many people that and i mean i've read your youtube comments like it's the same sort of thing with you it's like oh man i i read one uh on a video i was watching today and a guy was like oh, i'm fucking depressed i haven't rode my bike in two years but this video made me want to ride you know so it's just like it's a fucking powerful thing to do and i think once you kind of realize that it can have that effect on people it almost just makes you feel like it's something that you should be doing in a way dude it honestly makes me feel like i have a obligation uh right when someone yeah. tells me these things um i had a woman uh i was i was at an event and she gave me this handwritten note that she was suicidal and was going to commit suicide until she watched my impossible route video. And, uh, I mean, that was just like, that is so heavy. It, 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 I, I didn't know how to even process that. 
Uh, just recently, I got a, a, a direct message about someone who said that their kid, you know, had a, a health issue and um, like seven months in, they, they passed away. And that my videos like gave them some kind of happiness. And it's like, fuck, you know what I mean? Like what, like that is, that's some heavy stuff. And you know, I, so then I feel like I need to, I need to take this seriously. You know what I mean? I need, I need to put energy into this. And so some people, I was riding with this guy today uh, and he, he said, Oh, how long does it take you to edit a video? Like an hour. I was like, bro, a shitty video takes me like 10 hours to edit. And he was like, what? Like what? How? And he didn't understand. It's like, Look, you could do a video in an hour. It's going to be a piece of shit. Uh, but so when people yeah. are telling me this, that they, you know, and, and my content's not anything that crazy. But when I get these messages and I get these people telling me this, I feel I feel like I, I have to give it 100% or I'm letting them, mm. letting them down, you know. And so then what's hard, though, is now how do I... How do I value the people that are that hold a great place in my life, like my wife and my kids, over YouTube comments, right? So like mm. sometimes I spend too much time thinking about YouTube comments and what people are gonna think on YouTube that I actually forget what my family thinks of me. And they're the ones that are really mm. the most important, right? And I think that when it comes to balance, I've really had to try to remember that like they're they are really important to me and so I need to support them just at the same level they support me. And you know, I think that I have to dis disconnect myself from YouTube a little bit uh sometimes and what I'm doing and the things I'm doing like when I come home from a crazy event or a crazy ride, my wife don't care. She's like, "Hey, I'm going to football throw the kid to <laughs> yeah. you and, and you, you got to go. You know what I mean? And so like I try to have my family time completely separate from anything else I do. And we, I kind of already talked about that on how family time is, is uh, I really value it, but it's the moment where I don't have to ride a bike that I don't have to make content that I can just, look at my kids and be there and, and, and be with my wife. And that's like such an, a huge cornerstone of, of what keeps me going is them. You know what I mean? And I'm really fortunate. Like, dude, my wife, my wife is amazing. We've been together since we were 18. Right. Uh, yeah, you're we got fucking together. crazy. I can't believe that she is still around dealing with all this shit. <laughs> <laughs> dude, it's, it's gnarly. Um, you know, but so what I do with her is, I have to give a hundred percent to expect a hundred percent. So if I come home and I expect dinner, well, that's not, that's not me giving a hundred percent. Right. And so then if I give 80 and then she'll give 70 and then I give 40 and then 20 and then we both don't give a single fuck. Okay. Well, that's not good. Mm. So I got to manage, I got to manage her just like I would almost any other part of my life where I'm, I'm okay. So if you're riding a bike, uh, or let's say you're riding moto, you got to manage your gas tank. You can't just go out and spend laps for 15 hours. It's not gonna, you know what I mean? You got to manage your tires. You got to manage your chain. Is your sprocket loop missing teeth? You got to manage that shit. And that's how you got to manage a relationship with your partner too. Like I'll see when my wife's sprocket is getting a little, little pointy. It's like, okay, I gotta, yeah. I gotta help her here. Right. You know what I mean? And um, but as long as she knows without a single doubt that I, that I will repay the favor that I'll give her a hundred percent, then she can give me a hundred percent. And it's hard. It's hard to maintain that all the time. Um, but you know, it's like, I, I try to just sever anything else that I'm doing. I get home and it's like, okay, babe, I'm like, I'm all yours. You know what I mean? And, um, and yeah, I mean, she, she just keeps me rolling. Like right now we're on this little trip to go race street bikes. And I went to my physical therapist. Um, he got my body dialed. We're riding bikes. Like, dude, I'm just living the life. <laughs> but I talked mm -hmm. to her before this. I said, Hey, I'm going to go on this trip. You know, here's the goals. Here's what I'm going to try to achieve. Um, when this month is over, when I'm done doing a video a day, we're going to go on a trip. I'm not going to bring the bike. It's all going to be about you. Like I I'm going to repay this favor. 
and I've always done that. So then mm. she doesn't question it. Now, if I, I fuck up and I lie and I say, oh, at the end of this month, babe, you know, we're going to go to Hawaii and I don't, and I keep riding my bike. Well then, then now she's going to start doing that. You know, she's going to start not giving back and she's going to, anyways, my wife is, <laughs> she's the best dude. But yeah, we got together when we were 18. Yeah. That's crazy, right? We're 30. I turned 36, you know, a couple of days ago. We're both the same age. And so to maintain a relationship that long um, really is, is pretty rare. So, but that all comes from our moto shop. That comes from me and her running a shop together and learning how to be compatible. And, uh, mm. and yeah, dude, just, just having like a really neat experience through life with her. I mean, she's, she's my best friend for sure. Uh, when, when you talk yeah, to man. these, these high level people to kind of bring it back around to like everyone sort of similar, who is the highest profile person you've talked to that you're like, dude, I thought you would have been this way, but you're really just a totally normal dude. I don't know. I feel like no one's normal in a way <laughs> though. You know what I mean? Like it, it, in a in a sense like i'm weird as fuck like i know i'm so not normal and it's like my best friend sam he's weird as fuck too my brother he's weird as fuck like i think that that's probably more like the case is like everyone's kind of like underlying like we're all the same but then everyone's just got like their own version of weird i guess if that makes sense and it's just kind of like I don't know, like embracing each person's sort of weirdness. But I think that, I don't know, maybe um, maybe that's like one of the reasons why the show's done good is because like I'd never put anyone on a pedestal in, in that way. Like I've, I've always had this thing in my life and it was like a kind of a, like a negative while I was growing up is that I just had this thing of like no one on planet earth is better than me. I don't give a fuck at what, like I don't care who that person is, what they've done, whatever. I've never, ever, ever seen any person as better than me. But on the flip side of that, I've never seen anyone as worse than me either. So I feel like that's like, just, I don't know. That's like this baseline thing, uh, that I've kind of got, but I mean, yeah, I don't know. As far as like, the person well but that that's be, that's a great mindset think, to have you know to go in when you meet someone so like okay so i'm doing a video every day this month and today's video is, is actually like am i real am i fake or like how have i changed like how has youtube changed me uh and so i've kind of been talking a little bit and asking questions about like what other people think of me versus what they see on youtube and I think yeah. sometimes when you see someone, they, you know, you put them on a pedestal, you put them up, you're like, wow, this person is different in a way because somehow they're on my TV screen or whatever, but it's all this, it's all the same. Like you just, you're, I'm not any different than anyone else, right? I've just put stuff on YouTube and you see me, you know a lot about my life. The only difference is I don't know about your life. And as long as you mm. can sort of just, you know, like I never think, oh, someone probably knows me. Like this guy, this random dude today I rode, he, he like passed me, he was going hard. And I was like, I want to play bikes, dude. So I jump on his wheel and we're like playing, but at no point did I, in my mind think, oh, he probably knows who I am. Like he's probably watched one of my videos. Like yeah. it's just, we're just yeah. two humans riding bikes. And then he had said, your voice sounds really familiar. Um, are you in the movies? He was from Germany. So he had like a real German accent, but like, uh, and then we kind of started talking about it, but you know that I think that's a good point is to not have, not put people on a pedestal, even though they're sometimes so amazing at the one thing they yeah. do, but like, okay, Chad Reed, amazing motorcycle racer. Uh, but if we just were regular humans ordering Chipotle together, he's not going to order a Chipotle yeah. bowl better than I am. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. we're the same, we're the same in that, in that context. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I totally agree. Like, I think the thing I can, I just love to embrace whatever, like that person's like weird thing about them. Like Travis Pastrana, for example, like he's probably like one of the weirder dudes, like in terms of like, he's a, he's like a normal, 
he's probably the most not normal person i guess you could say but uh, again it's just like i just don't look at him as like better in terms of like just an overall thing it's like no one's better but i can just look at like that weirdness like whatever it is that is kind of not normal about him like i can really sort of like try and look and and zone uh in on that but yeah you're so right and i think that that was probably one of the things that i learned super young from like going to america and filming with all these people um and being around people in like their fucking bad days almost too you know like i've seen chad reed be a fucking dick and and, and it's like and i'm like i don't think that makes him a dick it just makes him human. It makes him like me. Like I'm a fucking dick a bunch of times throughout, throughout the day. Um, but, but yeah, a lot, of, like, a lot of people know, are like having a, a lot of people. Uh, have everyone those, is well, right. But it's, it's just a matter of if you put someone on a pedestal now, they can't do anything wrong. You know what I mean? And so mm. what, what I try to do is, is be as open and, and transparent as possible because one, I just, I don't really know any other way. I don't want to be fake on social media like that to me is is kind of weird and and also one of the main things about the youtube channels how i got started was that i wanted a catalog for my kids to see if i died right so Mm. if i'm riding my road bike and i get plowed by a truck how cool is it that my kids have a video documentary series basically of who their dad was and how shitty if i was fake how shitty if they had to watch Mm. this fake guy and be like dude that wasn't my dad you know what I mean? Uh, I want them to know me better. Um, you know what I'm saying? And so like, I, yeah, anyways, I just, yeah, yeah. I just put it out there. I just put everything out there so that when someone meets me in real life or, you know, outside of YouTube, like there isn't this expectation that I'm going to be anything different um, because I've already mm. put that forward. But a lot of these pro athletes, they don't get that opportunity. They don't get that opportunity to be yeah. a regular human. I, yeah yeah i think i think that's the difference like and that's probably it's sort of like what i was saying when i was a kid you know like you just see essentially like it's a poster it's like this perfectly lit shot and it's this perfectly produced thing and it's like or it's a a movie and you it sort of does create uh i guess a, a little bit of that mystique but i think those walls are sort of starting to to come down now and people are sort of finding that like the best thing about these guys is just the fact that they are so normal and i think it just gives people hope like oh i could just i could be something like that you know well and so the thing is that like adam i'm a huge adam fanboy adam hit me up i've hit you on so many dms uh but so like (laughs) dude with his vlogs they make you connect with him in such a way that's so different Right. And so when yeah. you and it's he doesn't even really do that much, but just giving a little insight uh, to to his personality when he goes over the bars and the whoops and breaks his collarbone. It's like, dude, you're devastated because yeah, you're invested in him a little more versus like the the Ricky Carmichael, Chad Reed, Stewart days of you're going to give this scripted interview and then you're going to just go away like. I remember in uh, it was at this it was at a San Diego Supercross or maybe it was Anaheim. This huge line of people were waiting for Chad Reed, right? And so they're at his truck, and everyone's waiting just to see him for a second. And he went out the back, you know what I mean? And, and yeah. like dipped all these people. And like, look at that level where you can't seeing someone or like, what if someone in the crowd said, "You suck," like that might ruin his night. Like he he's on such a razor thin level of of mental mm. stress um, that I get it, but as a fan, you're like, no man, like I want to see you just for a second, and I I remember that like that's one of the things I remember about Chad Reese, <laughs> like dipped out the back versus like uh you know I, I don't know you you go to someone else's pit and they're maybe not at that level, but they're just hanging out like drinking a beer like yeah having a good time you know and then so you feel connected to them in a way that like uh vince freeze like i kind of hit him up a little bit uh he gave my son like a jersey i saw him at um at one of the races that we went to oakland and like 
no matter what position he's in or what like heat he's getting on, on social media, like I feel a little more connected. I follow his story because I yeah. know a little bit more about him, you know? And so then what I would suggest anyone who's trying to have a brand of any sort, like whatever level your brand is, if you've got 10 followers, if you have a million followers, putting your personality out there is so important because then people can connect yeah. to you. Like, like you need like Velcro, right? Like Velcro needs the little hairs sticking up to get, you know, stuck to. That's what you have to do with your emotion and your personality. Like give some, a, a, a medium in which people can connect to you. Yeah. Well, I think that that's like, uh, I'm speaking of books. Uh, I'm reading a book by Nassim Taleb at the moment called Skin in the Game. Um, and it's so funny, like that, that theme of like skin in the game like that's what you've got now you know what you're describing about like putting your personality out there and like showing the you, you know like to me fuck i i'm on camera so much and it's like you know your fucking hair looks shit my beard hasn't been trimmed in ages i forgot that i was wearing a fucking lame t-shirt you, you know what i mean like you sort of just you've got to like really i guess like not give a fuck after a while but it's like the thing that matters is just like you've put that's you've got skin in the game like there's accountability like you're the one that's showing up you're the one that's like being honest when you talk you'll be it's coming across as like yeah you are genuine like you know like i was saying you were talking about your kid and not being out of bond it's like that to me was like the coolest part of that video because it's it's real you can tell it's real there's like there's some real value in that um you know, for me, and it's come from like you putting that, that skin in the game. And, uh, and you know, that's a, it's like this double-edged sword. Like you, the more you put yourself out there, the more opportunity there is for people to hate, but you know, the more opportunity there is for people to, you know, have like fine growth through that as well. And I think that so many people, uh, you know, will go and, and I've, I've think about that with me, you know, like when, when I was filming and I was in America and I was doing all that stuff, it's like there really wasn't that much skin in the game, really. Like it wasn't my name. Like my name's on nothing that was that I produced, really. Like there's a couple things, but it was like for clients and it was I was like in the background. So there's no you can see like the trajectory is not the same as when it's like bang this is me, you're getting everything, I'm being as honest as I can, you know what I mean? And I think that that's why, uh, and it's same as, you know, you're talking about AC, it's like the vlog thing, this fucking skin in the game, like he's put himself out there and he's showing you the highs, he's showing you the lows and it's like the more that you have, uh, you know, the more skin that you got in the game, it's the more reward that you can kind of pull out of it and it's like, the same thing of like doing this the impossible route deal it's like fucking talk about skin in the game dude like that's a gnarly thing to kind of like go and, and put yourself through and you know for me ne next year is going to be like a bunch of um that whole like life behind bars concept thing and it's like i've got an idea of what i want to do and a big part of that is like the easy thing for me to do to like make money would be to just like sit in this room and never fucking leave and just bust out podcasts and like tickle that YouTube algorithm all day long. And that would be like the easy life. And that would be like the fucking sick way to make money. But it just, I don't know. It doesn't feel like there's enough on the line in that sense. You know, it's like, I feel like I've got to fucking do more and really like, I don't know, put myself out there um, as someone that, you know, I guess is like really willing to, you know, put a lot of skin in the game to try and make, uh, I don't know, prove your worth almost. Totally. Well, so uh, there's something that I was kind of going through this year, uh, the highs and lows of doing these huge physical exertions, uh, kind of put like maybe like a physical induced depression on you. Um, and so, Anyways, I was in my low point. I was sort of just contemplating everything that I have and what the value is and that sort of stuff. And I was starting to kind of think of this idea of like, you know, when Ryan Villapoto and he even said this, his first championship, he is stoked. His second championship, he's pretty happy. Third, fourth is just a relief. And at a certain point mm -hmm. when you're doing something and you've reached a certain level, 
you no longer get that excitement. Like your first podcast you did with maybe your first big name, you probably left and you're like punch in the air and you're just like, fuck yeah, dude, like that was sick. But now it's almost like the more bangers you put out, now every banger you put out is just like a relief instead of an excitement. Mm. So then you need you need to find new things to get that excitement because relief sucks. Like that's just, you just build some pressure and then you relieve the pressure. That There's never like a point of of pleasure, right? Or like fun or like, like it's not good. It's just, it's, it's bad. And then you get rid of the bad. And so that's what happens mm. sometimes when you start doing, you know, with these films I've made, we've done five, we're going to put out number, you know, fifth uh, anyway this month, but like there's so, how do I better that? How do I keep that going? Mm. And that was one of the things is like when I started making regular YouTube videos, I would feel, oh, this is good. And then I got comfortable with that. And then now it's like, okay, well, I got to make something better. And then you just keep progressing. But at a certain point, what am I going to do? Ride on the moon? You know, like, how do I, like, how do yeah, I keep progressing yeah. this shit? And so when you do other things, when you sort of diversify your, you know, what you offer, the content you do, no matter what the return is. So if you're going to do this trip and it's the life behind bars and, and maybe it is, not the success that you were hoping for or the same success you've done in other areas, but it's new. And so you don't care. Like mm. you're just stoked that you did something new and you put yourself on the chopping block. You're like, Hey, I'm going to take this risk to make this content and maybe it's good. Maybe it's not, but whatever it is, it's an experience and it's something new. And so now I, instead of feeling relief that I did something great, mm. I feel joy and excitement that I did something new. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. Have you been on like a bit of a, uh, I'm assuming there's like a bit of a roller coaster with like the whole YouTube thing. Um, Cause what you said, you've been on it like eight years now. Yeah. I uh, probably, yeah. Seven, eight years, something like that. What's like the waves that you've kind of like gone through with it. And how do you think about like just being a, a content creator in general when I, you know, I guess just to kind of piggyback off what we were just talking about. Um, I just can't think about, I can't think about it really. So one of the big, the big things is that I've always had a day job. Uh, I, I own, I started a web development company and a data distribution service in the off-road aftermarket industry, whatever that has always allowed me to create content when I want and how I want. And if I mm. was a full-time YouTuber from the beginning, I'd have to suck every sponsor's dick. Every video would have to be brought to you by blah, 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 blah. And then that destroys the story. You know how much I hate fucking commercials when I'm watching a show and a commercial comes on. I'm like, get this off my screen, bro. You, you spent all this time making this story, right? So like, well, let's just say like a, a movie interstellar, good movie. You're watching it. You're stoked on it. You go through this roller coaster of emotions throughout that story. That's how it was designed. What if every five minutes there was a commercial? That story would be ruined, right? And so I had to figure out a way like, I don't want that. I don't want to have to make money that way. I just want to tell good stories and I want to make content the way I want to make it. I feel gross if I stop the story and say, hey, you need to go check out this home alarm system that I don't fucking use mm. and I don't care. They just paid me a check, right? I, I want partnerships with brands that allow me to do what it is I'm going to do. So like the sponsors with the impossible route, which is so crazy. Canyon bicycles came on, you know, at a decent amount of money. Like I didn't make, I actually just a video about this. will we'll go up tomorrow. Anyways, I didn't make any money. We, the money we got all went into the production of the film. I edited for free. Mm. I didn't like, I'm not balling out on this project. I was actually at 1.40 grand in the hole uh, because of the way sponsorship money came in. I had to fund this myself. So like I didn't get stacks of cash uh, to go and do this for myself. Anyways, the creative freedom that they gave me th the first one, they didn't see the film until it was on YouTube. Right. That's I could have, I, I could have uploaded a one minute clip of puppies 
and been like, thanks for the 60 grand I'm out, <laughs> you know, like, uh, but they trusted me. And then every one of these, like we actually had a premiere, like a film premiere at an event. No one had seen the video, but me. And so everyone just gave me this trust. And then in episode three, we did not say the word Canyon the whole hour video. So they're the yeah. title sponsor. They're putting out the most money. I didn't mention them once. That is an amazing partnership, right? And that's what, so I completely o- agree o- over time. Uh, I've tried to navigate through YouTube on one. What does the algorithm want? What do people want? What am I good at producing? And what do I want to do? The, so those are like the four like pillars of, I, I would say, how I, I look at YouTube. And I started doing informational videos, like how to get started with a power meter, because at that time, all that stuff was behind a paywall, right? You could, no one mm. was giving that information out, right? Um, now YouTube is full of tutorials for free. Like you could be like, how do I do open heart surgery? And there it is on YouTube. Uh, but it, back in when I first started, like it wasn't like that. So I started putting out this information, you know, and it was pretty basic, but people were like, wow, this is information that isn't really out there. Then people started doing that better than I could. So they were doing better informational videos, more in depth, better shot. So I was like, okay, well, I don't want to just keep doing this because I'm not doing it. I'm not do I'm not the best at it. So then I moved to these race breakdowns where I would voice over a crit race and I'd tell like what's going on and I'd show power and no one was doing that at the time. And so then that kind of like hit a stride where I was the only one doing something. And then other guys started doing it better than me. So this guy, Jeff Linder starts mm. coming in and doing like, which was funny because we're at a race and this, this guy comes up to me and he's like talking to all me about YouTube, like how it works and what I do. And I just, I'm not holding any cards to my chest. I told him everything. I said, this is the camera you should get. This is what you should do. This is the program. You know, you're really good at this. Like you should do these things. Like I just laid out this thing. Like six months later, he's getting like 50,000 views a video and like having a full-time job. Like, you know, and then he's doing it better than I'm doing. He's doing race breakdowns better than I could. So then I'm like, okay, well shit, I got to do something else now. And so then I started looking at, well, I really like doing adventure rides. Uh, I like just picking up a camera, going into the woods and I'm going to come back with something like I'm going to discover a story out there. It's out there. I just got to go get it. So I started doing some more adventure rides and then I started becoming like, I'm not really that good at crit racing or whatever, but like endurance efforts, five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 hours. That seems to be where I, I can be competitive. I, I can not world-class, but like I don't totally suck on the long stuff. Um, and so then I, then I s- wanted to make films. I was like, I want, like I told you in the very beginning, I want to make something that someone's going to watch five years from now, not know who I am. Doesn't have, matter. Mm. They're going to enjoy it. And so then I, I was like, okay, well, I went from one thing, people did it better. I went to another thing, people did it better. N- now I'm to this thing, and until people start doing it better, I don't know where I'm going to go from there, but those, that's kind of the three like stepping stones. And so to be honest, like it's been a upwards trajectory ever since. But how do I maintain that shit? What do I do next year? Mm. How, do, how do I continue this kind of workload um, and, and because I've already told so many stories, you know what I mean? Like how much more can I show me riding a bicycle? Um, I, mm. I think I've, I've, I've exhausted the creative juices on like interesting ways to show that. And so then what I'm hoping to do for, for next year is to tell other people's stories uh, to get like maybe adaptive athletes, like hand cycles, maybe like, an all women's, you know, crew. Um, we were thinking about doing like a, an urban impossible route, like on BMX bikes. You know, we were thinking about doing mm. some downhill stuff where like kind of like rampage, you got seven days to take a cliff face and make a route out of it. Right. Well, what are we going to do that keeps us relevant uh, that no one else is doing, but also tell a good story. And what do I, what do I want to do? Cause I don't want to, I hate working, mm. dude. I don't want to sit at a desk. I don't want to fucking work. That's why I'm <laughs> like, I don't want a job. 
So I want to enjoy what I'm doing. And if I'm not enjoying that, if I'm, you know what I mean? Filming the same old thing over and over and over again. Well then I'm not, I'm that's work. I don't want to work. Mm-hmm. I want to ride bikes. I want to tell good stories. Uh, and that's hard to do. Like it's like a very open ended cerebral type thing. Like I, I'm not sure how I'm going to do that, but we're going to figure it out. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's working for now too, <laughs> <laughs> but no one else is doing it. We don't really have a whole lot of competition. And actually someone did just mm. do like they recreated my first Hawaii video. And when I watched it back, I was like, ah, oh, they kind of did it a little better. <laughs> you know, they, they like it shot a little better. Like it, you know what I mean? Like, but it was such a privilege. It was such a honor to have someone watch my video and decide, let's go, let's go do that. Like they inspired us to go do the mm. same route, make a film. And so it was like, I was kind of like conflicted. I was like, dang, like, you know, do I have competition now? <laughs> like, uh, but anyways, man, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been crazy, but I also, my whole life and existence and worth is not based solely on YouTube. Uh, if I lost mm. everything, I would still have a, a, a smoking hot wife that loves me and two bitching ass kids. And so that always sort of is my base. And, you know, I know that it's like cliche to say like, I, I'd be happy in a, log cabin in the middle of the woods with my kids and my wife, but I, I think I would be dude. I, I mean, that's, that's mm. the core of my soul is like is family. And if you can find that core, you know, stone to like your pave floor, you know, everything around that supports it. And mm. you know, you can lose a stone here or there and it's not that big of a deal as long as it's not the core main stone if that makes any sense uh but yeah 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 did you um did you ever have any like with it's been you know like a long time like did you have any points where like the whole youtube thing just like really fucked with you um like the negative comments and the you know like have you kind of gone and like navigated that like gamut of emotions and was it like something that was hard to kind of go through because it is a very unusual experience to have i mean i'm not sure the analytics but it's it's a big channel you know it's like millions of people i'm sure um you know and then it's so weird too when it's like such a focused like microcosm almost it's like a lot of people but it's in like this one lane so it's like you can go i'm sure you go to like a fucking cycling race and it's like you're famous there and then you go to the chipotle and you're fucking no one like it's a very weird thing that not a lot of people like have to navigate yeah for sure um but so like the negative comments have been something i have to we are actually talking about it today it, it is, I would say I'm like a recovering addict in which that it doesn't bother me right now, but it's a dark place that could ruin me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get the analogy. Do you know what I mean? Like, like if I dive into yeah. those comments, if I think about it too much, I know, I know where my brain will go. I know how difficult it is to get out of that. And so I try very hard. I've, I've tried to put things in place to you should not deal with it or, or not take it as, as serious. Um, you know, we were talking about like, imagine going into a supercross stadium packed, filled and you know, 60,000 seats. Everyone's looking, you're at the floor, everyone's cheering. And one asshole at the very top goes, you suck. Is that going to bother you? No, you're not. That's not going to bother you. Why does it bother me in the comments? Why do I have a thousand people say you're the greatest thing ever? One guy goes, I don't know. It wasn't that great. It doesn't even have to be a shitty comment. It can just be like, eh, (laughs) you know, like, and I'm like, no. And I look at that one comment and I dwell on it. And it's like, I I then have these made up conversations and arguments in my head about this one comment. I mean, people's comments will rattle in my head for weeks and that's just not good. Mm. And so I've really had to navigate that well, because like, look, if you're in real life and someone came up to your face and said, Hey, you suck. When would that happen? When would that ever happen? No, like that's dude, dude. That, and if it did, that guy is, is an asshole. You know what I mean? Or you deserved it. Like whatever the way, like in, in 
real life, like that very rarely happens. But for some reason on YouTube, and because I put myself out there, this is what bothers me so much. I feel like I'm gonna show you my whole life. I'm gonna tell you my insecurities. I'm gonna show you the holes. I'm gonna say that I have a hard time bonding with my son. And then for someone to use that same thing against me and then talk shit about mm. something that I've opened up about, it's like, really, dude? That's kind of a, you know? But so the problem that I have is I can't exist in both spaces. Either I have to pay attention to the comments, read every one of them, engage and be in that community and also then get shit on, or I have to completely separate myself and be like, you know what? I'm not even going to look at the mm. comments. Uh, I'm not going to respond, respond because I can't, if I read one comment, I'm going to read all of them and I'm going to read the one that's not great. And I just, it's really difficult to go through that. But I will say this is that in, um, I've not really been able to deal with COVID very well. Uh, like the, the PR around that and how I'm supposed to act. Like I literally, literally deal and interact with bears more than I do humans. Like we have black bears that come to our house mm -hmm. every day. Right. And so I live in the middle of the woods, uh, in a town of 500 people, my experience, my life experience dictates, uh, a way that I behave differently than someone who lives in San Francisco. And it's not right or wrong. It's just different. And so then um, I had went to a race. I was so stoked. The race was on in Florida. I was like, oh, dude, I can't wait to go. And I went and I didn't because I don't really have my finger on the pulse of like what you're supposed to say or not say. Like, I don't the political correctness thing. Mm. It's like I just don't get it. I just think you should just say what you say and, and intention and context matters. But anyways, and so then I went to this race. Um, I was so hyped because racing had been gone for so long. I remember packing my bags and I just smiling from ear to ear, dude. I was like, I cannot wait to get back to racing. We get out to Florida. We go to this race. I'm having the time of my life. I post on Instagram uh, this cool clip of us racing. And then I just sit back and I'm just like, <laughs> I'm great. You know what I mean? Like I've posted content. And then all of a sudden, ding, the comments like, you know, why are you out? It's a pandemic. Ding, you're a piece of shit. Ding, you're killing grandmas. Ding, ding, ding. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't understand what's happening here. And so then it sort of coincided with someone else posting some shade about just people racing in general. And so then I was this scapegoat. And what you had said earlier about mm. like, you're the face now, but you weren't at a time. USA Cycling put on this race. They sanctioned it, but they're a business. Mm. So you can't yell at a business. You can't go stand out of a building yeah. and go, you suck. Like who cares? But I'm a person, I'm a face. So then I was this lightning rod of like everyone who wanted to tell people who were out and about to get fucked. I was the guy. Mm. And so, um, dude, it was hard. I mean, I've never dealt with anything like that before, but to have thousands of people telling you that just terrible, horrible things. And then like, uh, you feel as if those thousand people is the world, right? You, you, mm. when 10 people comment, you just assume, oh bro, everyone thinks this way. And that's not necessarily the case, yeah, yeah. but I was, I was in this situation where I was like, dude, I don't know how to, I don't know what to do here. And I was dealing with like people reaching out to my sponsors and saying, Hey, you need to drop this guy. Like he went out and raced. And then I tried to open up like, cause I'm an open person. So I tried to get in the comments and, have an open discussion like, Hey, well, you know, these are, this is the reason I made this decision. Uh, and I tried to have a conversation, a nuanced conversation. It was just not happening, <laughs> like not going to happen. And so, nah. um, I, I, I bent the knee and I made an apology post. And in the time I was so tunnel visioned that I felt like I was, I was pushed against a wall and it was a fight or flight thing. And I, f I f flew. I was just like, I'm going to make this apology post. I did not believe anything I said. I, I, and I mm. hated myself for that. 
uh, because I just, I placated to what I thought people wanted to hear. Um, I thought about the post a lot. I mean, I put a lot of time and I made this apology post and then it got even more shit. And so then I was just like, it, it, I had to take like two weeks away from social media and just really do some self-reflection. And I was so disappointed in myself that I didn't stay true to, to me um, mm. because of whatever, f- la- you know, uh, f- like re- consequences I was going to get. I was so worried that I was going to destroy my brand if I said something wrong. And then I started thinking like, oh, I- maybe I'm thinking about this as a brand too much and I'm just me. So fuck them. You know mm. what I mean? Uh, fuck them, dude. Uh, this is me and I'm going to live the way I'm going to live. And I don't think that I'm hurting anyone. I'm not, I'm not being malicious. I'm not out there promoting being crazy or anything. I'm just, just doing my thing. And if you don't like that, then there's lots of other content you can go watch. There's a lot of other people you can mm. follow. And so I was actually really grateful and again, super cliche to say like, oh, the terrible things in my life made me a better person. But having just getting, yeah, there's a reason it's a cliche, just getting shit on by people and then seeing people on Reddit make these like you see someone talking about you, like whole groups of people and then and then them assuming things about me, like wanting to shove me in this box like, oh, this guy is this way. And I was just like, dude, I don't even, I don't want these people in my life. I don't want them watching my video. I work too fucking hard to make this content for you to enjoy it, for you to shit on it. And so I don't know that that changed me uh, um, a lot. And so I, I'm going to, whatever I put out, it's what I want to put out. And if you take it, whatever way you're going to take it. Cool. But I have, I have partners, not sponsors. I have partners that will allow me to do what I want to do. Um, and that's amazing, right? If I have sponsors and it's like, Hey, we're paying you X amount of dollars and you better do this thing and be this way. That's their own you. I don't want that. You know what I mean? And so mm. I, you, you had said Grant Cardone, right? That was his name. Uh, that you turned him down yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Like, and I, I respected you so much for that because there's, there's times where I've been proposed a shit ton of cash to do something that just doesn't feel right. And I'm, I'm going to turn it down. I'm always going to turn it down because it, it just feels gross, dude. Like, like if you had done that 20 minute podcast, that's like an ad for real estate. Yeah. Like, dude, yeah. you wouldn't feel good about yourself. No matter how that would have worked. Like you stayed true to yourself and people are going to see that. And maybe you would have got a huge bump. Maybe that video would have got hell of views. But then what's the sustainability? What but who the next? fuck are those people? Yeah. Yeah. Totally, who are those yeah. people? Like, I, I just don't, yeah. I don't know if I want those people, you know, I was always, that's definitely one thing. Like I was always really down for like a slow burn on this thing. Cause it's like, Hey, I'll just be me. And if you like it, come hang. If you don't, you don't. That's one. Like whenever I get fucking negative comments, I, I like trolling people. I'm like a combative person. So like if people want to come at me, I'm, like I'm fucking down for conflict. Actually, there's a weird part of me that enjoys it. So I think that's probably like lended into like the YouTube comment thing a little bit. But I always just write back. I'm like, hey man, email our customer service. We'll give you a full refund. <laughs> it's like, you didn't fucking pay for this shit, dude. <laughs> yeah. So fuck off. I don't care. Like I don't give a fuck. You clicked into this. This is on you. This ain't on me. But when you put your heart and soul into something and then someone shits on it, it's very difficult to, uh, to, to, to not feel a visceral reaction to that. And like, mm. I think that if you aren't bothered by negative comments, then I think that you're not putting enough of yourself into that project. Mm. Right. Uh, I'm not yeah. a very clean person. My house is not real. I don't really focus on cleaning if I cleaned and someone came in and said, Hey, your house is dirty. I'd be like, yeah, okay, cool. Like I don't, like it wouldn't bother me at all because I didn't put any time into that. I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. You can tell me that. But when I pour my heart and soul into a video and then you say something negative about it, that does hurt because 
I couldn't do it any better. Like that, that is my, I, I said, this is the best version of me. And you went not good enough. And like that hurts, but mm. you know, I mean, I don't know, dude, we got rid of the dislike button now, which I don't really like, like that's kind of a bummer. I, I want to see that. I want to gauge what people like or don't like, um, you know, and the comment section always is kind of shitty, but, but when you see people in real life and I'm sure you've done this, like where you just somewhere and someone comes up and tells you how much they enjoy and you see this person because on YouTube, you don't see them. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. yeah. It, 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 like I upload a video and I don't have 50,000 people run into my office and start clapping and cheering and like giving me a thumbs up. It's just into the void. Yeah. Um, but when you're at, when you're somewhere and people are like, Hey, you know, like I really, this, this means a lot to me as I enjoy this. Like that feels really good. Cause then it's this real human interaction. You put a face to what it is that you, you know, to these comments, to these likes. And it's just really special, man. It's really special. And, and I don't know if you do TV or you did TV at all, but like, I remember back in the day, you had very limited content. You, you the, mm. the stream of consciousness coming into you was very designed and you didn't have an option. Mm -hmm. But now if I want to learn about quantum physics, I can make my YouTube feed all quantum physics all the time, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like, and that's an amazing opportunity now where we can control the content that we bring in um, and the entertainment yeah. we bring in without having, you know, these, these big companies. Um, it's just, it's yeah, dude, it's freaking awesome. The, the one thing I'll say, like, it's funny you said about like uh, the, like if you don't get affected by YouTube comments, like I'd say that there's a, there's definitely like, you can't help but be feel some type of way about it. But I've always had, and I don't know if this is a perspective that will hit with you or not, but like, dude, my mom doesn't agree with everything I do. And she loves me unconditionally. And it's just like, I don't expect her to like what I do. So it's like, why the fuck should I expect that a stranger would like what I do? You know, like regardless if it's the best product that I can make, like, you know, it could be the best podcast that I could fucking do. And I could have said some dumb shit to piss my mum off. So it's like, uh, that that's always been like my thinking when it comes to people leaving a negative comment. It's like, fuck, this isn't really like, this was for me. This wasn't for you in, in a way. Like, so I mean, maybe I've been like really selfish about it mentally in a way to where that's kind of how I think. But I'm like, dude, my mum doesn't like all the shit I say. I don't expect that you would. And if you want to tell me, that's fine. Like, I actually don't give a fuck in a way. And I don't know whether that's like a... I don't speak to many guys that have, you know, YouTube channels that are on the level that yours are. So I don't know how that, you know, sits. But sort of in my head, I'm like, I just... I don't expect people will like what I do. I hope they do, but I just fucking don't expect they will. Well, at a certain point when you put out so much content, there's going to be something someone doesn't like. Um, but you know, like when, I don't know, do you ever comment on YouTube videos? No, if it's people I know, like if I know their chat, like Jeff Walker or, you know, like your shit, I'll, I'll start commenting. But, but on you're, th your you're throwing them like some know, support. You're throwing them some support, right? Yeah, like, fuck yeah. I would I, never leave a negative YouTube comment ever. I'd I, never leave I a negative comment in general. I don't understand that mindset. I, I could watch the dumbest video, and I have sometimes. I'm like, what is this absolute piece of shit? I hate this. I hate everything about it. Never would I feel to go into the comments and cast that to this person. And maybe just because I, mm. I know what that is. But even before my channel... It just feels so weird to, to fucking shit on someone when it doesn't even matter. But, you know, whatever it, it's look, it's just a part of it. Um, but sometimes these people are just having bad days. Sometimes also they don't even expect you're going to see it. And so I think a lot of people mm. just want to cast that stone into the lake, see a ripple and just know that they affected something like on a primal level. They mm. just they can very easily with very little energy. A f have a big impact and 
you mm. know and so sometimes when you reply back people are like oh i didn't even know you were gonna see this or read this you know and so there's like this yeah. big disconnect because again in real life bro no one's doing that no one's gonna come up to your face and be like thumbs down <laughs> you know like that's not gonna happen yeah. Uh, but yeah, dude, it's been, it's been a crazy journey dealing with, with comments and also, I mean, dealing with the love, the love is hard to deal with when, like I said, when someone Mm. wrote me a letter saying that they were going to commit suicide, I, I, I don't even know how to process that. Um, that is, that's a, Mm. that's hard. That's heavy. And so like, what do I've had to get really good at, I guess, trying to process that and what that means to me. Um, but I always feel like I can't reply to them with the same level of intimacy that they are giving me that to, right? I can't Mm. match their level. I wish I could. Yeah, 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 yeah. I wish I could. Yeah, Yeah. completely understand. Uh, yeah, that's definitely like a kind of a weird, a weird part of it as well. I mean, there was like. I'd say probably for the first two years of doing this, I was just in a, like a pretty shitty place, just like in myself. And then it was so weird for me to feel like almost like the shittiest I've ever felt and have so many people being so pumped on what you're doing and you just get messages and it's on a, like a different level now. Like that was, you know, a long time ago, but for, for then, you know, to still have like hundreds of people messaging each week and, you know, it was start, it's, it's always been kind of like building and it, it was super fucking weird to be like feeling really shitty and really low and like fucking going through breakups and like just, borderline depressed you know and then people are telling you how fucking great you are and how good your show is and you're just like dude i'm like not fucking doing good but you know i did i always kind of kept it like fairly separate um and then i don't know like i i feel like um you said before about like the saying yes to things i think there was probably a really long time where i just like didn't really accept that there was like potential to be successful because like being successful, especially when you like, you come from being pretty fucking low and like really down, there's just like not a part of you that like believes that you're worth the success that you're like on track to have. And then, yeah, there's, there's like some, a, a lot of weird shit that even, yeah, it comes with just like getting love and having people enjoy what, what you do. And, and it, it is a one-sided relationship at times you know and then and they're only seeing you like at your best on the on the podcast and it's a fucking it is a that's probably i'd say that's harder for me to deal with than like the negative stuff the negative stuff i really don't give a fuck so how do you make sure that all those positive comments don't inflate your head like how, how do you not start doing the, the conor mcgregor walk where you're just like fuck i'm a badass dude all these people tell me great things how do you how do you handle that go to jiu-jitsu and just get fucking flogged <laughs> dude jiu-jitsu is is such a i i just recently went i hadn't i hadn't rolled in a long time and uh, i just recently went and so in my mind i'm still a world caliber purple belt uh i get there yeah. and i have no calluses i totally forgot about calluses and so then, dude, that my toe knuckles, which is gross to say toe knuckles, my toe knuckles were destroyed, right? Like my everything that touches the mat, gone. Um, and then I'm rolling with this guy and I just, even though I'm like really fit, I just, my body just doesn't have the, like. You just the, withered. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it's like the connections. Like everything's just off. You know what I mean? So it's like uh, if your chain was just not slipping into the sprocket slots, it's like riding on the top and it's like yeah. clicking. Like I know the moves. I'm giving it the throttle, but just everything's not working right. Because it, it takes time to like get your body to sort of connect all those, you know, and then that's when it's, you call it rolling or flowing. Like all it feels so good when you r- roll through a sequence and you land what yeah. you're trying to land. And I was just like, I was just doing step, you know, there was like step one through seven and I'd go step one, four, six. And I'm like, shit, why didn't yeah. it work? Yeah. Well, cause I, you know what I mean? I'd been off of it for so long, but I left there. Um, I, there was this other guy I went 
uh, this guy, Chris, he is a big time cyclist. Um, but then he got hit by a car. So he stopped riding and he actually ended up getting into jujitsu. And so I've watched him sort of go from cycling to then go to jujitsu all the time. And then I went there and me and him rolled. And now I, I look at him differently, right? Like before he was just a cyclist Mm. and, and maybe I could kick his ass, you know, like, but now I'm like, dude, you're actually solid, you know? And, and now there's like this weird mutual thing where like, there's no ego there anymore. You know what I mean? When you know you're going to butt heads and it's not going to be, you're not going to win. Then I don't know. There's sort of, it changes how you behave with other humans. Right. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, definitely. Now, I think uh, d- the the serious answer for that question of like, how do you not let it get to your head though, um, is I think it. I think the podcast thing's kind of weird um, in the fact that it's sort of what you say. It's just a YouTube thing in general, though, you know. But it's like it's in the ether. Like, there's so you know, you get a video that's got a million views. It's like it doesn't mean anything. Like, you get paid for it, and it means something. Like, based on the check that you get. But like you can't see those people. It's like a, you know, Wolf of Wall Street. It's a fagazi, it's a fagazi, it's a sh- like that's what it is, you know. But really, really, honestly, at the core of like me, like I know that this was luck. There's hard work that's gone into it, and at times I've made my own luck, and it's like there is me, me, me that's involved in it. But it's like. I didn't fucking choose to be born. I didn't choose to have the parents that I did. I didn't choose the influences that I did. I didn't choose to have Wes Williams fucking uh, give me a shot in the US. I didn't choose to have, you know, the guys that I did as friends that introduced me to these people. I didn't choose that the personality type that I have resonated with certain people. I didn't choose. None of this was fucking me. Like, it feels like me but it's not really me in that sense. Like I am not special in any way, shape or form. And like, I just genuinely do believe that. And like, it does feel great. And like, I mean, there's times like, there's definitely unavoidable times where like, you know, so we went to ASBK on the weekend and it's like, you know, you're walking down pit lane and then there's like Jack Miller and you're walking, we're filming. And then there's people yelling his name and then there's people yelling my name and it's fucking weird and it's a trip. And there is, there's something there that it makes you feel a certain way. And then there's like the weirder, darker sides of it where like, you know, you look at, you're like walking and you've got something to do and you're like out in the open with all these people. And then you think like, fuck, how many of these people know me? How many of these people are going to stop me right now? And like, stop me for like, I'm trying to just dump this card. Like we've, I've got a red card. I've got to dump this red card. It's going to take ages. I got to get the other, like you're in that zone. And you, there's like a weird feeling that comes over you of like, fuck, please. No one try talk to me right now. Like I've really got something to do. And then that's fucking ego. Like that's a really weird ego thing to kind of like think and feel. So, I mean, there's definitely stuff to navigate, but it's like, it's funny, you know, like you, you do that and like you're at the, you're at that race and fucking so many people know you taking pictures of people the whole weekend. Then you get on a plane. It's like I said before, you know, like then you're only famous in a microcosm to like a really niche group of people. So it's just like, I don't know. It's just like, you can't drink the Kool-Aid. Like you have to keep perspective of like who and what you really are and then also having like super famous friends that are like really really famous definitely puts it into perspective of like what it is and i mean that's like one thing like i got a couple of friends that and i, I don't even like saying like names because it feels gross but um there's like a couple friends that i got that they're like as famous as it gets and when you see how they operate and there's almost to me like i've seen the way that guys like that can move and operate and that to me seems so much more virtuous and so much more that seems dope to me that you can be like that dude and you can be the fucking biggest like global star and you're so fucking humble and you're so down to earth and and you're you know that cool so to me even there's a little bit of ego in that of like oh i want to be like that but 
it's like if you're going to want to be something you should want to be the more virtuous thing so i don't know i feel like there's a couple of different levels where i've sort of thought about it and it'd just take the fucking fun out of it too i reckon if you ever kind of drank the kool-aid in a sense totally uh you said something that you don't think it's you and i and there are times where i will look back at a video especially these big like these big films i'm like dude i don't know who did that i don't know who wrote it oh i don't know bro that's me every fucking podcast it's really strange that there is this other thing that is Mm -hmm. able to somehow be the create like uh, what people think I am. I don't think I'm that like there's this other thing mm. that can edit and work and hustle and has a great story. But what is it's like there's this alternate person persona or personality that sort of comes like it takes the light and it gets the job done. But what I think I am is this scared little boy that doesn't know what the fuck he's doing and I just want my mommy, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like, like that is what I would say I am. But then everyone sees this something else. And I even see that other thing. And it's like, who, who took the light to make this edit? Who took this light to get this done or, or, you know, and that sounds really weird, but it, it it's like, there is this other person, um, that isn't me that's getting a lot of this done that's doing a lot of the things that are are awesome in my life so I feel almost identical to you in which when I sit back and I look at what has been done I that I didn't do it I mean I guess Mm. I did but I don't think I did you know what I mean like I always have an excuse of why things happen to me in a good way right like everything that happens good I'm just like well that only happened because like I never go, I never pat myself on my back and I'm like, fuck yeah, dude, like you crush. Like it's sort mm. of this other persona that's, yeah, it's, it's really strange. So it was, it was neat to hear you, uh, hear, hear you say that, you know, and it's on your Instagram story. Were you on the back of Jack's bike? Yeah. Or who like, okay. So you yeah. were, okay. You were just holding on to him. Like, yeah. like, like a date, like, nah, there's his- like, dude, <laughs> nah. There's like on the fuel tank, there's like a little set of handlebars and then there's like these tiny pillion pegs. And then I was sitting on like literally a seat this big and he tried to fucking murder me. It was hectic, like a religious experience, dude. It was fucking crazy. I can't, I've struggled to put into words what that was like. Okay. But so I I used to race street bikes. Um, I, I got pretty good. I'm going to race street bikes tomorrow. I could never imagine someone being on the, like you have to lean in a certain way. So how do you, if you don't know how to race street bikes, how do you do, how do you match his body positioning through these turns when he's flying? Dude. So, well, so I, uh, this is probably the coolest thing that happened to me this year was like doing a, a Ducati ambassador deal and so i've I've started riding like on the track we're about to put out some content of like doing some track days so i had one fucking track day under my belt so i kind of got like i got to get my knee down and i got to like kind of do it um you got your knee down on your first day on the track yeah but i had troy bayless and ollie bayless coaching me so it was like i had some pretty good people around to like make it happen um But, like, I kind of knew what went into, like, turning the bike. So, but, yeah. And, I mean, it's one of those things, like, Maddie called me, my brother. So, my brother's Jack's, like, manager, management for, like, a lot of his personal stuff and the shit that he does at, at home. And uh, so, he calls me. We're at the track film and he's like, dude, do you want to get on the back with Jack? And I was like, no, I do not want to get on the back with Jack. And he's like, all right, cool. Well, I'll, I'll tell him not to worry about it. And I was like, well, no, like I fucking kind of have to do this. I can't not do this because I will never hear the end of this if I don't do it. So it was just like, it's funny, you know, when you say like, it's not, it's not me out there. I was just like, full content brain like okay well this just has to happen i don't really want to do it it is what it is hey driving to manji like i didn't want to fucking drive for 10 days to get to a fucking dirt bike race but just what it took to get the job done so then 
yeah anyway maddie's just like yep well we'll get on the back and uh and yeah it was uh so one day of riding on a track ever and i would just i i knew don't put weight on his back when he's braking because i knew the braking was going to be super gnarly and that's pretty much what jack said he's like just don't lean on me when i hit the brakes he's like i'm gonna hit the brakes really 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 hard and you're gonna want to like go flying over me so just like don't push me forwards and then he's like and then keep your knees as wide apart as you can so that i can like move my hips and uh dude we were doing 230 kilometers an hour around a turn like it was fucking psychotic and that video <laughs> down the straight well, I, that it, it, I, I down watched the main it, straight I, I, we were I doing 280 i watched it a couple times and i was like i don't understand what is special about this and then i'm i'm like i don't get it and then i realized oh shit there's someone on the back of that you know like i just thought it was him and that was it and then it's like, wait, who, do, what, how? Because, dude, it's so you know now, but like the uh, the the first time that I was, you know, started doing track, there's it was called the landing strip, and it was like a quarter mile. So you come out of this banked turn and button willow, and then you'll you'll get fast. I mean, you'll be 140, 150 miles, and I don't know what kilometers and a lot of kilometers. Anyways, you s- sit up to hit the brakes. And the wind hits your chest so hard that you feel like you're just going to fly off the back of the bike. And I, and I didn't realize how wind behaves, you know, at that speed and like literally putting your leg out actually uses, it's like a, a air brake, you know what I mean? And yeah. it's, it's gnarly, dude. Uh, that's so crazy. You did that. And it's so crazy. You have such a limited experience, but getting your knee down tr- day one is, I mean, I did a track day. And I, it just took me all day to even like feel comfortable. Uh, it took me a long time to start feeling, you know, good enough to get down on the knee. And then I can't wait for tomorrow. It's been 12 years since I've ridden a street bike. And um, so I'm really excited about that. But uh, so again, and what, then so that's weird because I don't know. I think an R6. Um, it's yeah. I did this velo guide with a guy where I took him on like, okay. So talk about like, do things because they're the right thing to do and your uh things will always come back to you in a good way like i have this sort of business mantra of like if you don't want to worry about money don't worry about money just don't just don't if you just don't worry about money you'll never have to worry about money and so if you if you if you start a relationship with someone with the finances being the first thing well now you're worrying about that the whole time and so anyways, this guy, he, he paid me uh, on this website where people can pay me to take them on like tours, like guided cycling tours, which makes me feel like an ultra douche, right? That someone's going to pay me 150 bucks to ride with me. Like in my mind, that is super douche cape. Uh, and so then he comes and he's riding with me and I take him up, you know, this really cool road and I try to provide a lot of value. I try to engage with them um, as like a friend. Uh, I try, I provide like bottles and and I and pictures and there's a lot that I do outside of just like showing them around. And I live in a pretty badass area, so like it's cool. And and anyways, we're doing this, and this guy opens up to me, and and I've never met him before, and all of a sudden, an hour into this, he's telling me how his girlfriend, um. And they had spent like four years of like their best life together. She had terminal cancer and wanted to uh, do um, suicide. Like the, the, she wanted to end her life, you know, like voluntary. Oh, like assisted suicide. Yeah, 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 assisted suicide. And so then I'm like, what the shit? And so then this guy is telling me the story about the night he had to administer the medicine to her to kill her. Oh, fuck. And I'm like, Oh, what? Yeah. And so I, I couldn't believe it. Like what he was telling me and, and, you know, he built the story up. Like I, I didn't know his wife was, or, uh, his, it was his girlfriend. Uh, I didn't know she was dead until like the very end of the story, <laughs> you know? And so then I was like, wow, you guys have a great relationship. And he's like, oh yeah, she passed away like six months ago. And, and then I was like, wait, what? And then, then he tells me a story that he administered the medicine to this woman that he loved. Jesus. And so then I'm like almost in tears thinking I can't wait to get home and just hug the shit out of my wife, dude. 
Uh, but so we have this really amazing bonding experience. He, he opens up with me. We get to the top of this climb and like, it's a three hour route. That's what he paid for. Um, 150 bucks. And I was like about to go down, take him back to, to, to Bass Lake. And he's like, you know, I'm feeling really good. I like to keep going. And he's like, it's totally good. I didn't pay you for more. Like we'll end it here. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to find my own rides. You go home. And I was like, no dude, like I'm not going to do that. Uh, that doesn't feel like the right thing to do. I'm not going to leave you out in the fucking forest. Like what if you got a flat, like what if, what if something happens? Um, and we were close to this really amazing lake that no one like knows about. It's like a kind of a local only thing. You kind of have to hike. So I was like, Hey man, let's, uh, I'm going to take you somewhere really special. And so it was actually an additional like two hours, um, of my time, you know? And so like whatever, five hours and I got paid 150 bucks. I know that I'm riding, but you know what I mean? Like that's five hours of time I could have been yeah. spending. Take him to this lake. We get done and the guy is just so grateful and uh, and it turns out that he's actually a, a baller and i but i didn't know this like i didn't know he had money so he like hands me a wad of cash and he's like hey this is a tip you know for being so awesome and then he hits me up like a week later and he's like hey like we're doing track days all the time you can come out and you can ride these bikes like we'll pay for the track day we'll pay for the bike like tires gas the whole thing like he just all of a sudden all this love and support came my way and it's like wow you know what i mean like i and and it was so what happens if i don't do that what happens if i worry about mm. money and i go well dude i can't i'm so i can't take you up this lake it's 150 bucks where i can't justify that shit uh and then i leave him i never now have this opportunity to go race street bikes tomorrow right and so yeah it's those it's that thing when you engage with people if you think you're special and your time is is super valuable and people owe you something that's weak as shit and you're not going to ever mm -hmm. get these amazing opportunities that stem from just being a good human and sometimes mm. you get taken advantage of sometimes it, you know you look at the bottom of the line you're like dude i kind of spent a lot of time doing something it didn't really pay off but who cares because down the line you will get an opportunity that only will come from being a genuine good human. Yeah, no, I com I completely agree. I even think about it more like pragmatically, like when I said that it's just all luck on my end, like I genuinely, truly believe that. Like even down to the point where I spoke about before, I'm, I fucking won't get too deep into it, but it's like I just don't even believe that free will exists in the way that we think that it does. So it's just like you just literally have luck. And then you just got Shakespeare that says there's neither good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. So it's just like, okay, let's just follow this train of like, good luck would be the better thing to have, right? So it's just like, you do, you get like this good little bit of luck. And then if you try and turn that good luck into more good luck, and it's just like the good, good is the word that is kind of like the through line here. And it's like, as with all luck, you don't, you know, you not, you don't know what it is before you get it by definition. So it's like this good luck could turn into bad luck. But statistically speaking, being the basic mathematician that I am, I would just assume that if I wanted to maximize my chances of good luck, I would just spend more time being good, you know? So it's just exactly to what you said it's like if you want good things to happen just do good things because all we really have in life is luck so like if you want good luck just do good things that's heavy dude <laughs> that's heavy it's like no no free will man that's that's pretty that's pretty gnarly but like when you know you get down to dissolving how your brain works sometimes and you get rid of the consciousness uh aspect to it through maybe psychedelics um you know i <laughs> uh, i really like psilocybin we grew our own mushrooms um microdose that and to a point where it's like no not you're not psychoactive i mean this is like the equivalent of like a cup of coffee just kind of makes things a little more vivid yeah. uh, a lot of research shows that under like guided therapy um and meditation you mm -hmm. can reroute some of your brain you know pathways Anyways, so um, I put on this cycling camp, this Yosemite cycling camp, which 
I bring people from all over the world uh, and I, I give them this amazing experience in Yosemite. I charge basically the least amount that I could possibly charge for a six day cycling camp. We cook the food. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, I take them to Yosemite in the areas. Anyways, one of the guys came to the camp and he was like, Hey, do you want, I have some mushrooms. We're about to go on a big ride Saturday ride. Uh, and I got to manage getting 30 people plus campers through this kind of technical route through the woods. He's like, Hey, do you want a mushroom? And I was like, well, to me, one cap and one stem is like a micro dose. That's what I have at home. If I take one cap, one stem, I'm not out of my mind at all. It's no big deal. So then I eat this mushroom thinking I'm going to have a micro dose, right? And then I'm maybe an hour and a half into riding and I wake up riding my bike with no prior experiences, thoughts, emotions. Mm. I am a floating ball of consciousness that just appeared on a mountain. <laughs> like I, I don't know where I am, when I am or who I am. All I know is that I'm on a bicycle and I'm going forward. And that was a, you know, a, a really amazing experience, like to blend nature, physical effort. And then I'm around all these people. Uh, and, and then I'm like bonding with them in such a weird way. And I, I, I think this, the science behind it is that like psilocybin breaks down a mechanism in your brain, which says this table is not me and this is me. Mm. But but what it mm -hmm. breaks down, so then you feel like bonded with things because you don't know actually what is you and what isn't you. <laughs> uh, and so, mm -hmm. anyways, dude, it was like this crazy experience of like, I don't have any prior memories, egos, um, preconceived notions. I'm just out riding with people, and like, everything was just so good. <laughs> uh, and and I don't know, like. So, so free will, I maybe would have had more choices in that moment, but when I sort of stripped everything away, it was just like automatic. It was just, it was mm -hmm. just the flow of time, like the ocean waves. So hippie. Uh, but it was just, I, I just went with it and I didn't, mm -hmm. I could know that I couldn't control it. Couldn't control time. I couldn't control anything. And it actually got really hectic because we had a group, part of the group split and we had to get them in this turn. And like, if I wasn't a floating ball of consciousness, I would have been freaking out trying to control everything. And mm -hmm. I kind of just was able to defer to, you know, the volunteers and the staff that were helping me. Like I had some really good crew, you know, that I'll, I'll let them do what they want to do. But I don't really know what that story has to do with anything, but I wanted to work in my psilocybin trip while riding. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, yeah, like the, the free will thing is like a fucking huge rabbit hole. That's a book you should read uh, by Sam Harris. It's like literally would take you a day. It's not a not a massive, a massive book, but I guess it's just like the uh, it's just like these inputs and outputs, you know, like you just don't really have the control. Like you don't think your thoughts before you think them you know like they're just delivered to you and it's like there's there's when you really really inspect um the causes and effects like you're it's everything's a mystery like it feels like you it's very consistent like the choices that you make feel consistent to you um like when when you're if your daughter falls over and smashes her face on the concrete and busts her lip and has a cut on her head like you your default reaction is to run to her and embrace her, tell her it's going to be okay and care for her like that. And, and it feels like that's your will. Like you feel like you're doing that. You feel like it's what you should be doing. Uh, but in reality, like there's no other way that you could have acted. And if you did act any other way, like let's say if you just stood and laughed at her and then like held your wife back and your son back from picking her up off the floor like that's not you anymore you know what i mean so there's like this weird kind of like you kind of can tell yourself yourself the story um of why you did things and there's like this consistency that's there and, and it feels like you but when you really inspect uh, you know, where these things are coming from and like the way that you just follow these impulses, like we're just on a ride. Like it is, 
it is just a movie of your own life you know that you're watching and it's like you can't you can't control your ability to understand english like at at no point of me talking can you by your own freedom of will just decide to stop listening to like to stop understanding what i'm saying and if i say to you don't think about a pink elephant like how do you not like is there any way that like where's the freedom in that you know so and then to kind of go back again it's like what was your what was your first thought that you don't you don't know you don't remember and but then every single thought that you've had it's like a stream of consciousness that you've had since day one every single thought that you now have is predicated on the thought that you had before which again was just delivered to you in like this kind of constant constant stream and i think that that's one of the you know that this is to get like super deep buddhist style shit but it's like that is the root of suffering is to think that you could have and should have done well not should have at times you should have done something different but to think that you could have done something different you know that there's like this ideal version of you that would have acted differently in a in a different way it's like you think about a golfer missing a putt or like barry bonds like hitting a home run versus not hitting a home like he hit the home run he couldn't have done anything different the universe at that point in that time was the way that it was like those were the conditions and then the result you know the that was the cause this was the effect and we're just living in like this constant um i guess like this constant flow of prior causes effects you know and even to to talk about um you know like it's kind of like a different line of thinking but that what you said about that mile like i'll just do another mile i'll just do another mile i'll just do uh another mile it's like there's not even such a thing as like unbearable pain you've already bore it like if if something if you can sit and say something is unbearable like you actually have already bore that thing to be in a position to say that it that it is unbearable so it's like we just i i just we exist in a completely different way that that we think that we do and it's like you you know to so much of life suffering comes from thinking we have this freedom to think and act in in other ways that we i guess ideally think that we should um and i you know i think a lot about that with the podcast like i never listen to them after i've done them it's like there's i'll just regret it (laughs) i'll just i'll think about i should have said this i wish i said that man that made you sound like a fucking idiot this was lame you should have done and it's like there's no to live in a world where i think i could have done something other than what i did and could and should are completely different deals here you know like maybe i should have done something different but again at that time with the cause and the effect and the input the input was this the output was that and i just didn't really have the degree of freedom to move around otherwise well i mean did that helps you keep moving forward when you're not worrying so much about Mm -hmm what has already happened and since you can't control it it's done you know what i mean you can try to learn from those mistakes um that that's obviously something but like it, it's it's almost like um the price is right like plinko you know where you drop the little mm. disc and it just plinkos down like that's what that's what i envision using this kind of thought process in real life so you can get super mm-hmm. hippie and and be like nothing really matters you know like everything's in the matrix but so like how do you how do you make that thought process actually something you can use to your benefit and to me it's like i'm going to let go of this plinko disc and it's going to bounce down these things and it's going to end up somewhere i just need to let it go and then not mm. worry about where it's been and it might go left it might go right it might go into the jackpot it might not but I have the control to at least send it. I, I'm going to let go mm. of it and just let that thing do what it's going to do. And I think a lot of people, they're so worried about like, well, where is, if I make this decision, I've got to roll with the, the I've got to control all my consciousness moving forward. So when I say yes to mm. this opportunity, whatever that opportunity is, if it's 
riding seven days in Death Valley, if it's going surfing for the first time, if it's sitting on the back of a death machine at 280 kilometers per hour, holding onto a dude's waist, I'm going to just get on and we'll just worry about it later, right? Like I can't control the whole process, but I can control the start of it. You can press the button and then see what happens. And 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 so I think that like when you're born, just kind of what you said, like the stream of conscious starts, but everything starts building up. And over time, what you end up getting is a probability cloud of where you're going to exist yeah. and the things that are going to happen in your life. And that's where yeah. I think sometimes we can sort of see into the future because the probability, so hippie, uh, of where we're going to be sometimes is maybe 99%. The probability I'm going to have a daughter given a decision that I made when I was three, you know what I mean? That, that stream and that rolling ball of, of consciousness makes it to where there was no other choice. This was going to happen. Now, Mm. sometimes I think that the probability is less than that. And it's like, well, it could go this way. It could go that way. And that's why when sometimes you have like premonitions or you have a dream and it doesn't happen, you're like, ah, whatever. But to, to keep the hippie thing going, when my, my wife was pregnant with my daughter, we had not got the sex. We didn't know. There's just a human in my wife's stomach, and, and I'm right next to her. I, we're laying in bed, and I'm thinking, I, I'm so close to this human, but I can't see them. And I was like, okay, I'm going to astro plane like, out of my body. I'm going to go into her womb, and I'm going to see my daughter. Like, w- weird. And I had what I, I I almost want to say it's a dream, but it wasn't a dream. It was a memory because it was so vivid and Mm. so, um, uh, structured, you know, how when it's sometimes in a dream, there's like no walls and you're on the moon and that's all normal. Yeah. Yeah. This wasn't that way. This was in my living room. It, or this was in my kitchen. Actually, everything was same. Like I wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a dream. It was a memory. I was just reliving a memory of me st- like getting on one knee and looking at this like eight year old girl and talking to her. And during this, I'm like, what the hell? Why am I talking to an eight year old girl in my kitchen? And it was a very weird. And then I'm like looking at her face. And when I woke up, I, I was like, babe, you're having a daughter. Like we're having a daughter. Uh, and, and not only do I know it's a daughter, I know what the fuck she looks like. Cause I talked to her when she was eight. And I know, and I know that's so weird, dude. That's so weird. But like now that she is getting older, that face that I saw in this weird dream memory thing is exactly what her face is. Like she is growing into that and it's going to be, and I always remind myself because it's easy to forget these things, right? And then I always try to remind myself that there'll be a time where I kneel down in a kitchen and I go, whoa, this is deja mm. vu. I've been here yeah, before. Yeah. Why have I been here before? I'm yeah. going to I'm going to go dude, it was before she was born. This memory somehow existed in a way that I was able to tap into. Weird. Dude, yeah. I have not I have nothing for you on that. Like <laughs> that shit's real and I've had a bunch of like weird déjà vu moments that are like that, but yeah, I've got no fucking idea how that. And I you know what? It's probably not worth knowing. There's like some weird, that's like some on the other side of the void shit that I just don't think we can get at. So when you, when you're around these, these people, like you have a very unique way of looking at life. Do you, uh, do do the people that are around you agree with the things you say, or do you feel sometimes like lonely that you're not able to talk about this? I'm completely (laughs) alone. Yeah, I'm completely it, alone. Every, everybody thinks I'm a fucking nut. All right, man. Well, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's no. It's, I mean, it's uh, no. It, it's uh, it's funny. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing where I was saying before. Like, yeah, my dad. Like, he doesn't. You know, can't relate. It just. It is what it is. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just. I don't know. I just don't even like put that much stock in it. And I think that it's funny. There's uh, sometimes on the podcast talking about stuff like this it's like that's my only chance to talk about this sort of shit is because it's like i'm fully you don't have a fucking choice if you're playing this in your car right now suck shit this is what we're talking about (laughs) you can fucking turn it off if you want you know um but yeah it is like i try and uh i try and um 
I guess, bring it into context of like how it's useful though, you know, because well, that's like, what, that's man, what's I so hard. S- that's what's so hard about it is that yeah. you can think about all these crazy things. Uh, you can think about like aliens or universe or time dilation, fractals, whatever. I then got to go make a cup of coffee. You know what I mean? And it's mm. so weird sometimes when it's like you think about these crazy scenarios um, during a, a story that didn't make it into the film for episode one at Death Valley was that Jeremiah uh, in the middle of the desert, I think day two, saw a penny on the ground. Why there was a penny on the ground in the middle of the desert, who knows? He picked it up, put it in his bag. Why he did that, don't know. Come to the day seven, we ride to this Japanese internment camp, which I never knew that this happened. And so it was really oh, neat. Oh, yeah. And so there's this yeah, huge. I've fucking, I've seen that shit. Yeah, they put these people in the middle of the desert. <laughs> like, it was so crazy. Gnarly, huh? Yeah. Like, that is that is science fiction where it's like, hey, you're in prison with no walls because you can't go anywhere. Where are you going to Where are you gonna go? Yeah. It's the desert. And so we go to this Japanese internment camp and we get there and everyone has laid coins down on this monument. And then Jeremiah pulls out this penny from his bag that he had found like four or five days earlier and sets it on the monument. And there's this picture of Jeremiah like placing the coin and I'm sitting like crisscross applesauce kind of, you know, meditation style. Huge mountain range desert monument Jeremiah somehow connecting with this in a way he didn't know and I was just taking in this moment and it was just like it was really fucking cool it was it was it was a moment that seemed like destined to happen on so many different levels Mm. and then so to kind of round it back to the content creator side I sat and tried to tell that story in the film for maybe a week and a half like a good 10 days, mm. I tried to figure out a way to tell that story, but mm. I had to have, I had to have explained or, or like I, sh- I needed to have a footage of him getting that penny on day two to seed that story. Mm. And, and, and already the video is fucking an hour and 40 minutes. So like to explain everything that went on there was going to take like 30 minutes to do. And I would have had to have redone the edit. But I was like, God, this is so cool and I want to use this and we have all this footage and it's amazing. But like it just didn't fit with the storyline that I had been that I had been that I was on. Right. The stream of consciousness Mm. started and now I'm all the way at the end and I can't undo it. I can't go back. I have to just start over for that to make any sense. So it got cut and uh, and, you know, I, I need to do like a shorts channel or like put on like little separate things where I could just make that little side story, you know, um, mm. cause it'd be really cool. But like, yeah, dude, it was just so, it was a really special moment. Um, and, and yeah, sometimes you don't know why you do things. And if you question why you're going to do like, why am I going to pick up this penny? Don't, don't ask yourself, did you have an instinct to pick mm. up the penny, pick up the penny? You know, do you, yeah. do you have an instinct to say yes to this opportunity? You know, maybe the opportunity is like, hey, I have an opportunity to go work in Switzerland. And your wife's like, what the fuck is in Switzerland? You're like, I don't know. Like, but this feels like a really amazing opportunity. And maybe you get there and it sucks ass and you come home. At least you have a cool ass story to tell. At least when you're at a cocktail mm. party, you can be like, hey, remember that time we moved to Switzerland and we lived in a, in a barn and it was terrible. And then we moved back. Like either way, good or bad, it doesn't matter. That's an experience. That's a notch on your belt. You know what I mean? That's a that's a that's a golden star on the wall. Like, who cares if it was good or bad? Just do it. Yeah, well, I think I think uh, the that's funny that story where you're like, oh, this felt like destined to happen. I think like that's kind of the 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 freedom in this, right? Is like if you can kind of if you can. I guess subscribe to this way of thinking and you can kind of you said it before you're like oh well nothing means anything it's like okay well we need to kind of like reframe that because right there and like nothing means everything like that's the secret to all this is like there's no free will you're not really the author of your 
uh, thoughts. You're not writing the story in your head that you're telling yourself. You're not the you're not the one that's really driving this conversation that is like seemingly making you do and be everything that you are. So it's pointless. There's nothing there. So it's like okay, you've been giving this you've been given this meaningless life that means nothing that you're like not in control of. But it's like you have the ability to, there is this like story and there is like this, uh, the meaning that you can uh, prescribe to like this meaningless situation. So it's like, that's like the gift, you know, do away with all the, the suffering that is not yours and you're not responsible for in that sense. And then it's like, this this feeling of like that you can give meaning to situations whether it's like good or bad like i just i choose choose in air quotes then to just like make things mean like meaningful everything meaningful like you just we have this like rare ability as like human beings to be able to prescribe meaning to like this ultimately meaningless situation so it's like if if you've got that ability to to give this meaning to the meaningless thing you might as well make it like a really great meaning dude we're we're kindred spirits bro uh so what's where i can take that from is that i'm a huge fan of spectrums uh and growing one side of the spectrum grows the other and what i find Mm. about cycling that allows me to enjoy life better is that when I am suffering so bad, that expands the spectrum to one side. Mm. And then it's also going to open Which up. Which ultimately, the, yeah. So yeah. then what happens is when I'm sitting on the couch watching Bob's Burgers, I'm fucking stoked because I'm not in the snow or the rain or, or I'm in a road race getting embarrassed. You know what I mean? Because I'm getting dropped. I'm not in the desert, I'm not, ugh, all these things that I've put myself, you know, I'm not racing across the West, dying, puking on the side of the road, like all those bad things that I purposely put myself into allows for me to feel a sense of joy with such of the mundane, easy, simple things. Yes. And yeah. if you are like, I almost feel like it's the worst possible thing to be born an extremely rich person because then your spectrum is fucked. What brings you joy, right? If you've, if like, if a Ferrari's always in your garage, if everything's always taken care of, what, what is cool? What is good, right? I mean, that's why the Pope fucks kids. (laughs) Like if everything is, you gotta go to some pretty weird lengths, you know, you gotta go to like some pretty weird places. Like what's the fucking uh, Jeffrey Epstein dude, you know, like, yeah, he's a billionaire. He's weird as fuck. What do you do? Like me, me and my buddy Sam. Sorry to cut you off on your story. It's all good. Um, me and my my buddy Sam. Like he's one of my best friends. We've known each other since we like I was eighteen. He's a few years older than me. And uh, man, we have done so much fucking shit together. Like the experience. There's so much stuff I'll like never fucking. Maybe I'll talk about it one day. There's like so much insane shit. Like the highs have been so fucking high. And the lows have been so fucking low that there's so many times in our life where we're like, dude, like nothing seems that cool to me anymore, (laughs) which is like kind of a weird, like a weird place to be. So like, that's just too, like we're fairly normal, you know, like we've had a pretty fucking not normal life in a sense, but yeah, to be like the Pope or to be the president or to be a billionaire, it's just like fuck that is so weird dude like what would feel what would make you feel anything again like talking about your spectrum yeah and so that would that would suck because then now you have to do something and so then what ends up happening is that's why i think like exercise and like tough mutters and spartan things these have become so popular because you manufacture uh adversity and you you have to have that in your life we've become so soft that everything is just so like on these impossible routes, what's crazy is, you know, Death Valley, we had to the start of the ride to the end of the ride. We had to be self-supported so we could bring all of our food and water at the start of the ride. But we couldn't we couldn't get anything from the crew. Uh, episode two, we were fully self-supported through three days. 
And what ends up happening is that like food takes on a whole new role. And I remember in episode, yeah, man. episode two, the third day, we're riding 170 miles. It's pouring rain. And I'm like digging in my bag. And I find this little gummy bear that's covered in dirt. It's like soggy. And, and like there's like part of a pickle on it. Bro, it was the best fucking gummy bear I've ever eaten. Because of the context in which yeah. I ate that gummy bear. I was, because everything sucks yeah, around me. And I'm so hungry. And I'm just like, and I find this shitty gummy bear with a pickle on it. And I'm just like, bump. And I'm so happy. And that's where spectrum comes in. It's like, what is objectively happiness or objective suffering? Is it, mm-hmm. it it's not, the, it, there isn't. It's, it's all subjective. You can't say... There's this this documentary you should totally watch it. I think it's called Babies, and uh, it, and it's it's old and it's like super cool and it follows four babies from zero to like two. Have you have you heard of it? I think I've heard of it. Yeah, keep there's, going, keep going. There's two of them, one that's in San Francisco and one that's in uh, Japan. Like all the toys, like everything is great. Uh, that the life rips, everything is met like babysitters, soft things, you know, all the stimulant. Then they have two, one in Africa and one in Mongolia. And I remember the kid in Africa is like face down in some mud. And then he's like chewing on a bone, like an animal bone. I, the kid in Mongolia is like naked and he like s- scrapes his like dick across this like rusty barrel. Uh, and, and to get like this cat. And it's like snowing and they were way happier than the ones that were in San Francisco and Japan. Like they, they, like, and maybe they could have edited it. Maybe the editor was, you know, whatever, but all yeah, the footage, yeah. all the footage of the ones that had everything, they were crying, they were fussy, whatever. The ones that were bro in the middle of uh, Africa, the, the, the mother was wiping its the the kids ass with corn like a corn husk and this kid is so happy dude because just eating just getting your basic needs met like oh i get to eat today fucking stoked well once once yeah that's no longer a happiness for you eating well so now what okay well now i'm warm Mm -hmm. i'm stoked okay well now what now you have a nice house okay well now my transportation is easier okay cool now what and you just keep going and going and going. And then so sport and whatever you want to do, like, here's the thing is, okay, I, I'm, I'm plant-based. I'm a cyclist. A lot of people will say, I, I hate you for those things. I don't like the way you think. All of the things that I've learned can be applied to any sport. So it doesn't matter if you don't want to ride bikes, if you don't want to eat plants, I don't care, but do something and broaden that spectrum. If you want to ride motos, if you want to ride BMX, if you want to hang glide, whatever you want to do, uh, you know what I mean? Doing the sport and and suffering in that sport and having a hard time in that sport, you know, with like moto, you drive out to the track, you get there, your tires flat, you're trying to do the spoons and one whacks your fucking finger and you're like, God damn it. And then your spoke is broken <laughs> and you know, all this stuff and like, you're all bummed and the day sucks. But what happens the next weekend? None of that happens. So then your day is awesome. You know what I mean? You're like, yes, dude, I'm yeah. so glad my f- tire's not flat because you had a flat tire the, mm-hmm. the, the weekend before. You know what I mean? And so when you you reframe these negative things, okay, so like, I don't want to put them on blast. I bought Ryder D's uh, bike. I, I actually have bought two bikes. I bought Style Robinson's uh, old Cowie. Um, and oh, that was, yeah. Cause, cause their Cowie deal, what happens is like they, they get bikes, then they, when they're done with them, that Kawasaki like refurbishes the whole thing and then they, but they can't advertise it. So then I get like a bike for a smoking deal. So styles bike was like brand new, brand new grips, brand new motor, everything. The chassis had like 50 hours on it. Cool. So I bought that Ryder D, uh, he was doing the same thing. I was like, I'm going to get a brand new 21 KX 250. And so I went and got it. I bought uh, my, I I just bought my son a a CRF 150, but that wasn't coming in. So anyways, me and my son came to the supercross race at Tulare. Uh, It was like a futures 
um, qualifier. I'm so stoked. I cannot wait. It's me and my boy all weekend. We're practicing Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I've got a brand new bike. My son, I just built his top end and we unload. My son's back brake is not working. I'm like, okay, well that's kind of shitty. I was like, all right, bud, um, not using your back brake today. Like no back brake drills. And then he's starting to ride and it's like making this weird noise in like the transmission. And then it just keeps slipping. And so then I'm like, damn it, dude. And so then we uh, find someone uh, really, I mean, dude, the moto community is so amazing. I go and I go, hey, my son's bike is blowing up. Does anyone have another 65 he could ride? And like no hesitation. You know, this guy's like, oh, bro, I've got an extra spare bike. No worries. I'll let you ride it. So then we, but it didn't have a front brake. So we transferred the front brake. We did some work on it. Anyways, my son is riding. And then I get on my brand new bike. I get three laps. And the motor blows up and it's like, dude, this is a brand new bike. What, why is this happening? And I was so angry at the moment and because I had put so much, like I had worked so hard. I had gotten all my responsibilities done. Like this was a week. I never get a weekend, dude. I never get, it's all about content. It's always something. This was just me and my son riding motos for three days. I couldn't wait. I had put all this emphasis that this was going to be the best weekend of my life. Uh, I had done all the right things. Like I built, my son had a brand new, you know, top in, like he had new tires, all, all the things that I had in my control, I did right. And every single thing went wrong. And, and so then at a certain point I was like, dude, what the fuck, man? And I was so distraught and so deflated that I had driven, you know, I spent all this money to get, anyways, I was so deflated. And on the drive home, I was just trying to think, like, put context to this. Is this good? Is this bad? And that is up to me. This experience happened. It's, it's up to me to apply meaning. And I, the only thing I could think of is, you know what? I was going to go on that super cross track. I was going to probably go double, triple, and I was going to break my neck. Mm. So that, you know, and if I broke my neck, what would I have been thinking in the hospital when I went, oh, can't walk anymore. Guess I'm fucked. I wish would my be bike think- blew up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. Wish my bike had blown up. Wish something small had happened to stop me from getting to that point. And maybe yeah. that wasn't going to happen, but it was something that I reframed that whole situation to where I was, dude, I was so depressed and so angry. Uh, and then once that, once I thought about it that way on the way home, I was like, yeah. There'll be another weekend and it will be awesome. Yeah. No, nah, that's so rad, man. Well, we've done almost four hours. I knew that this would be a long one. I've, uh, I've really enjoyed it, man. Thank you so much for like just making it happen. Like this podcast is on you. You made this one happen. I, um, I really appreciate it. I've really, really enjoyed it. Uh, I'm going to try and follow your content a little bit a little bit more might even buy a gravel bike kind of feeling like i want to do uh some form of cycling now after after listening to this um and yeah well, i'll get out there stoked, to australia really I'll, I'll get out there in your area at some point i'll take you for a badass ride uh maybe we could do some sick project together where we ride bikes way too far to ride motos all the way back something like that you know i'll do sick, that dude yeah but hey man, I really appreciate yeah, it. You you responded you responded to my messages when you didn't have to. You know what I mean? And so uh you know, yeah, I bugged the shit out of you, but you you replied. <laughs> so dude, I, I really appreciate it. Really, really appreciate you giving me this opportunity because I'm I'm just a fan. I'm a fan of the whole industry, I'm a fan of you. Uh, I'm a fan of the people that have sat in this chair. I take this really seriously and I hope that um I hope that I provided something to where someone listened to this and, and was like, Yeah, that that didn't totally suck. I enjoyed my time. Nah, no, no, I, I really enjoyed it. And I always say to guests, like, I mean, when we sort of do the off air thing, people are like, Oh, how was it? You know, I was like, man, as long as you had fun, if you had fun and I enjoyed it, that's really all I care about. It. It's a selfish endeavor in that sense. But I think at this point, uh, if I enjoy it and the guests enjoy it, other people do as well. So I feel like I just try not to think too hard about it um outside of that so um and uh we literally this is one thing i respect about you we did that whole podcast and the word vegan did not get mentioned once 
your channel on YouTube is called The Vegan Cyclist. Uh, so if anyone wants to go uh, and look at some dope content, I actually thought about it too. Like literally last night, I started watching some of your clips uh, and I was like, ah, I fucking get it. He doesn't really care about the vegan thing that much. It's fucking clickbait like the the name like you you clickbaited your own channel name and i fucking it's genius i respect that so i i made that name in the very beginning not knowing that this was going to go anywhere because of the search engine optimization at the time people were yeah. searching for a famous guy in your area and uh and so i named it that because no one could pronounce his name everyone was typing in the vegan cyclist so that's what i did now plant-based diet is a huge part of my life. I love it, but it, I never went that way because anyone yelled at me about it. And so I never used mm. that word. Uh, it, look, it's, it's everyone's nutritional journey is their own thing. Do what you want to do. Um, but yeah, man, I look, we don't need to talk about that, but I love motos. I love bikes. And, uh, I like talking about hippie shit and that's what we did today. Nah, perfect, man. Well, I appreciate it. Enjoy the track day. I'm fucking jealous. Hopefully, I'm going to get out there uh, on the weekend and uh, and put some leathers back on as well. But um, yeah, really appreciate it. You came a long way to do it. And uh, yeah, thanks so much, man. Awesome. Thanks, bro. Sounds good, brother. If you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe. And to listen to the full three-hour podcast, search Gypsy Tales in your favorite podcast platform or click the link in the description below. Gypsy Gang.